Good evening. Could we please have everybody settle down? Please stop warming up. So we're starting a business meeting and we're happy you're here, but we need you nice and quiet so everyone can hear and you will be playing shortly. So the Newford County Board of Education was just in executive session and we have not finished all of our items from executive session. We still have the, the fourth uh, bullet point that's on the agenda and we will go back into executive session at the end of public session tonight. So this meeting is February 21, 2023 and is being conducted via hybrid video conferencing. So now we're back in public session and Secretary Middleton, do we have any action as necessary or appropriate regarding the matters that we've discussed so far in executive session? No, ma'am, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. So we now need a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, Mr. Campbell, I made the motion to approve the agenda and Carlton Dallas made the motion to, uh, or seconded that, that uh, motion. Any discussion? Uh, Ms. Boatwright? Thank you, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Um, I would like to remove OE8 from the consent agenda, please. Okay, so, um, and be discussed separately. Yes, please. Correct. All right, so Correct. that will go under uh, board business action. Seeing no further hands up. All those in favor of approving the agenda with that one modification, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, and abstention? Voted no. Okay. So the motion to approve the agenda uh, carries, passes. We'll now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. moment of silence. Please be seated. The media was properly notified. Now have the privilege and honor of having the Beaufort Middle School Orchestra performing Viva La Vida and Arizona Sun arranged by Mark Wood under the direction of Amanda Trimpey. musician to Beaufort and have a performance with him on stage. We're having a whole day workshop. We're very excited. So here is, we're we'll starting with Arizona Sun. Slow it down. Um, actually, 
Oh, we are also debuting a few of our electric instruments, which we recently purchased with a grant from the Junior Jazz Foundation on Hilton Head. So we're very happy to have received that money so we can have our electric cello. We have electric violin over here, and we have multiple electric pickups on our instruments, which we're very excited to have. Is that better? Do we want to turn them on? One more. more.
All right, Dr. Rodriguez, points of celebration. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gwads and board members. As you can see, we've we've got uh, a lot of talent in Buford County, and we got a lot to celebrate this evening. So, uh, if you give me an opportunity here, I'll get started with the points of celebration for for this evening. First, point um, of celebration. We're going to talk about the January students of the month. And uh, Character Ed for January uh, is a Character Ed is a program that was formed to support parents' efforts to develop good character in their children. And tonight we're celebrating the Character Ed Students of the Month, exhibiting the character trait of perseverance. Perseverance is defined as pursuing worthy objectives with determination and patience, while exhibiting fortitude when confronted with failure. We're happy to announce that our Character Education Student of the Month for Northern Buford County for January is Lily Johnson, an eighth grade student at Buford Middle. And here with us tonight to introduce her student from Buford Middle is Principal Miss Landy Thompson. Well, let me first say good evening. Thank you so much for having us to allow us to perform before you today. And clearly, given that I am now coming before you to introduce you to our student of the month, you know that our standard is excellence. So I'm excited whenever we have opportunities to bring those excellence um, exemplars to you. So again, good evening. I would love to tell you that Lily um, is enthralled about being here today, but I'm teasing her because one of the things that Lily is, is very humble. She does not like a lot of attention. So when we have opportunities to celebrate her, it kind of makes her flush a little red, which when I tell you a little bit about Lily, you'll be like, hey, that's a little bit of a conundrum there because Lily is an outstanding student. I'm going to read for you what her teachers say. She exemplifies excellence in her pursuit to achieve her academic goals. Her academic performance in both internal and external examinations are worthy of commendation. She is actively involved in school life as she relishes drama and is a member of the theater production team here at Beaufort Middle School. Lily has consistently outperformed other students when given similar tasks. Additionally, she exhibits excellent leadership qualities within the school culture as she is quite reliable. At the beginning of the year, Lily had several difficulties and um, obstacles to overcome, and she has overcome those struggles by exhibiting high levels of self-confidence and academic structure. Based on these premises, it is our privilege to nominate her and to award her and recognize her as our Student of the Month for Perseverance. Lily Johnson. And through the form, we do need to give her joy because she did skip out a little early on her Aladdin um, rehearsal to be with us tonight. So be looking out for those. You, you did what? Oh, well, then there we go. Be looking for announcement for our performances soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Our character education uh, January student for Southern Buford County <clears throat> is Ashley Ames, a senior at Hilton Head Island High School. And here to introduce his student is Hilton Head Island High School principal, Mr. Steve Shidrich.
Being board members, thank you for having us tonight. This was written by uh, Miss Mary Beth White, our IB coordinator, who uh, felt very strongly about nominating Ashley. So I'm going to read her nomination. Ashley Ames is a senior at Hilton Head Island High School and a member of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, class of 2023 cohort. She's also a varsity lacrosse player who is signed to continue competing in college at Converse. And she is an active member of our school community. Ashley demonstrates perseverance in many of her academic and extracurricular endeavors, and she deserves to be recognized as student of the month for this trait. The IB diploma program is challenging, and the students who choose that course of study must work with determination to continue learning, keep their grades up, and develop skills for the future. Ashley has accomplished all that and more. There were times when she wasn't sure that the full IB diploma program was the route for her to, to follow, but she stayed committed. She's tenacious, a deep thinker, and a great student, and she has an independence that is admirable. Through her perseverance, she has been able to accomplish much through the IB Diploma Program. Additionally, Ashley has shown resolve and dedication in her extracurricular choices. She did all the research to get herself NCAA ready for college lacrosse, and she has been a leader in some of our school's most impactful clubs, such as Academic World Quest, Model UN, and DECA. Her club faculty advisors agree that she demonstrates perseverance in all she does. Last year in Model UN, she earned a Distinguished Delegate Award and helped her team play second. But more importantly, she took a stand against some bullying that occurred at the Model UN competition and rallied her teammates to persevere through that situation. Although lacrosse will keep her from competing with Model UN this year, she will continue to help the team with her research skills and resolution writing. Her involvement with DECA reflects the same type of dedication. Ashley was elected president of the club and scored high on the performance portion of the last business event, but when her test score wasn't high enough to satisfy her, she sought information on how to improve on the test, and she started studying. Her perseverance was demonstrated once again. From academics to athletics to the issues of equity that come up in the world around her, Ashley Ames always shows a spirit of resolve to do what is right. We are happy to nominate her for the Perseverance Award. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay. Congratulations to Lily and Ashley for a job very well done. We're very proud of you. Next item is H.E. McCracken's Beta Club State Convention Awards. Last month, several H.E. McCracken Middle School students participated in the Beta Club State Convention, earning placements in their competitions. One student from Bluffton Middle School also attended and placed at the State Convention as well. Here to tell us about the convention and introduce H.E. McCracken students is our instructional coach, Linda Tuttle, followed by Bluffton Middle School Principal Matt Hall introducing his student. Before uh, Mr. Milling, I'm sorry, from H.E. McCracken uh, goes, uh, goes ahead, what I'd like to do is call students forward, because as you can see, I've got uh, quite a list. And so I'll ask our students to stand over here on this side where we can gather uh, and then take a picture with some distance. And so if you come by here first, grab your certificate, and then head over to the corner over here. So first is Skylar Steger. Kylie Beckman. Caden Swafford. Lucy Vandervoort Johnson. Isaac Hernandez Perez. Keegan Heron. Molly Williams. Carson Richardson, Ava Desario, Samuel Houchin, Lilia Clark, Kevin Claffey, Good evening, board and all community members. My name is Mr. Milling. I'm the principal at H.E. McCracken Middle School. 
I am here to present our Beta Club members and uh, with their joint effort with Bluffton Middle School. Here I have Dr. Linda Tuttle, who was also recognized as the John W. H. Harris Award winner for um, those who sponsor our kids. We have 75 beta members at H.E. McCracken from sixth to eighth grade. And 41 attended the um, local convention and we'll have all of our students eligible for the national convention as well. And of those, we have 11 students who's placed and those names that Dr. Rodriguez read with one group performance and four premier performers. So we thank you all so much for your um, dedication and support for H.E. McCracken. And we thank all the people at H.E. McCracken who are doing a great job to recognize our students and build them up and recognize their bark as we continue to build H.E. McCracken and to be an excellent school. Thank you all. Good evening, I'm Dr. Tuttle. Um, I just want to say thank you for this recognition. Sorry, <laughs> um, I am so proud of these kids. So the McCracken first case and our blessing kiddos, I get to work with all of them and I'm super proud and I can't wait for them to go to nationals in June and demonstrate and you know showcase their talents and represent um, Buford County. I can't wait because they're special kids. So it's going to be great. Thank you. Everybody, uh, just a couple of notes here on this fantastic young man standing behind me, Caden. Uh, as Dr. Tuttle uh, mentioned, did attend the uh, state beta convention, um, and some things that I think are important to know about Caden. Uh, teachers talk about how dependable he is, how they can always rely on him, how he is the ultimate hard worker in the classroom, um, and that's exemplified through his active membership in Beta Club for the, uh, for the past three years. Um, not only is he ambitious in everything he does academically through evidence by being enrolled in all high school credit classes and maintaining grades with nothing lower than a 93, um, but he's also a truly round, well-rounded student in the fact that he's also an athlete for us on our track team. And he is also involved in four of our bands here at M. Buford County School District as a distinguished musician, not only above the middle school's band, but he also uh, made all county band, region band, and he also is a participant with May River High School's marching band. So, Caden Claffey, I believe we all need to give you a round of applause for your fourth place finish at the state convention in the math competition for Bank. Also, May Rivers concert band. Thank you. Okay, next on our points of celebration this evening, we have the Scholastic Arch Gold Key recipients. Several district students have been honored in the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards competition. These prestigious awards are the nation's longest running program for creative teens in grades 7 through 12. The district's eight top award winners, Gold Key recipients, advanced to judging at the national level. Silver Key works are judged to demonstrate exceptional ability, and honorable mention works are judged to show great skill and potential. I'm going to invite the students up as I call their names. Their artwork is displayed on the screen. The Gold Key winner from Beaufort High was Elizabeth Sherbert for Spoons. Gold key winners from Hilton Head High were Alondra Kalula for Max and Toby painting, Addison Fisher for the life of a flower fashion, and Karen McDonald for Lady of the Lake photography. Thank 
Goldkey Village from New York. For High were Olivia Buck for Evening Subway Photography, Grace Enyart for Self Portrait Digital Art, Addison Gorley for Swimmers Photography, and Robin Zetrar for Grit Photography, and The Boy Photography. It's great to see our students express themselves through various artistic processes. These awards are a testament to our tremendously talented students and our phenomenal art teachers who bring our district's art program to programming to life every day. Next item, uh, points of celebration that we want to recognize this evening is the Academic World Quest Competition. Last month, the World Affairs Council of Hilton Head hosted its annual Academic World Quest Competition in partnership with the Buford County School District. This year, I want to first take a moment and recognize Bluffton High School, who was identified and selected as the most improved team at the Academic World Quest competition. We can give them a round of applause. During the competition, the teams had 60 seconds to answer questions projected on a screen. Questions came from categories such as current events, great decisions, NAFTA, Saudi Arabia, security, and India's bid for global leadership. Lots of contemporary topics. Lots of political science related topics as well. Here to introduce the winning team that is from the May River High School is the May River Academic World Quest coach, Joshua Germany. And I think I saw Principal Bornschauer there. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I. I want to defer to Mr. Germany, the coach, Dr. Germany, but also want to acknowledge, I believe the first time I ever met Mr. Carlton Dallas was in their sponsorship of this event and welcoming the newest school, May River High School, to the competition. So thank you for making this an important part of your own life. Good evening. I'd like to thank the board and Dr. Rodriguez, as well as Mr. Bornshauer, who has been extremely supportive of May River's Academic World Quest team. I know I'm speaking for the team when I express our appreciation for the attention we're receiving due to this academic achievement. These students worked hard and still felt they could have done better. We're proud to represent Beaufort County Public Schools at the national competition in April. Thank you. Congratulations. Braden Mancini. Oscar Carlin, and Lawrence Germany. Noah Lowry. And Haley Schupard. Congratulations. 
As we continue celebrating students this evening, Bluffton Middle School teacher Emily Lyons, South Carolina National History Teacher Day. Patricia Baring is Teacher of the Year. E uh, Emily Lyons, Teacher of the Year, and the Patricia Baring Teacher of the Year. Each year, National History Day recognizes the outstanding work and dedication of teachers with the Patricia Baring Teacher of the Year Award. This year, one of our very own received this prestigious recognition. And here to introduce the 2022 Patricia Baring Teacher of the Year is Bluffton Middle School Principal, Mr. Matt Hall. Good evening again, everybody. Um, I just wanted to just briefly explain a little bit. Um, so this is a distinguished honor. Uh, as the South Carolina National History Day, Patricia Baring Teacher of the Year recognition, as Dr. Rodriguez shared, National History Day is a competition that our middle school students partake in uh, that involves an extensive amount of research. Um, and we're thrilled to actually have a partnership with one of our local colleges, USCB, as they allow us to utilize their facilities for our students to be able to go over and access uh, for their their personal library, their university level library to be able to do some in-depth research. Emily's strong background in ELA made this an easy choice this year as she does an incredible job infusing literacy into her history content for our students. She's now in the running for the national recognition, which will be determined later in the school year around May or June. And I think we got a pretty good shot this year with this one, but what makes Emily special um, is she has been willing to do anything and everything I ask her to um, with a lot of a lot of growth as an educator over the past few years. She originally came and served at Robert Smalls uh, when she initially began in the district and she came to us to Bluffton Middle School a few years ago um, and was an ELA teacher and then she became an interventionist for us uh, where we had that need and she fulfilled that need but she kept coming to me, Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall, I love history. I love history. And I told her, Em, but you're so good at ELA and you're such a good reading teacher. Um, but it's always wise to put people where they're passionate at. And she has absolutely flourished this year on our eighth grade hallway um, and has been truly a, a guiding figure up there on that eighth grade hallway for our social studies team. So it is my honor to congratulate you, Emily, on this well-deserved award at the state level and looking forward to that national one coming back. So congratulations. Now, for the last item on points of celebration, but not least, it's the South Carolina School Boards Association Boardsmanship Institute recognition for school board members. We had two board members that were being recognized tonight for their achievements in the South Carolina School Boards Association Boardsmanship Institute. The Boardsmanship Institute offers a year-round training curriculum to help board members develop skills and stay abreast of state and national education issues. Workshops focus on school law, advocacy and legislation, improving board operations, leadership for improving student achievement and other timely topics. Board members earn points for participating in those workshops. And it's my honor tonight to recognize two of our board members. Reaching level one by earning 25 points within one year was board member Angela Middleton. Also, my honor tonight to present the first recognition to Christina. Well, I'm sorry, the second recognition to Christina Guads, who's being honored for reaching level six 
in the School Boards Association six-level recognition system. It is the highest level of distinction for school board training. Dr. Gwads, I believe, received on Saturday, uh, on Sunday, uh, the recognition and and uh, uh, um, I think a certificate or, or a, 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 a a plaque. A plaque. Thank you. Uh, was provided at that time with it. So we want to congratulate both of you. Thank you for your service on this board and your for, and for your continued growth and professional development as board members along the way. And at this time, this past, uh, well, this month in February, we held the African American History Education Conference. Uh, the second annual African-American History Education Conference. And our board member, Mr. Earl Campbell, was recognized with the Shirley Perry Lecture Award at the African-American History Confer Education Conference. The committee nominated him for this award because of his commitment to community service and his own personal untold story of attending a Booker T. Washington school. As you'll see in the video, Mr. Campbell is a very much a historian, sharing his personal perspective and experiences, honoring the legacy of Joseph Shanklin. We're here to honor a unique individual in Beaufort County. Beaufort County has many historical figures. Robert Smalls coming to mind spent decades in service to his country, to his state. And we have another individual like Robert Smalls, and that's Mr. Earl Campbell. Over the years, I have known and seen him to be the most dedicated, the most caring, and probably the calmest person that I have known. Yet, uh, he is tenacious in his ability to move forward to do things for the good of the community, and especially in the education of our children. Education was always a big thing for me. My parents and grandparents, I think they went to fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade, but they were always interested in your education. And that was everybody, not just the, the teachers and your parents, but everybody in the community. Mr. Earl Campbell was born in the county, raised, went to school through the Beaufort County School District, entered the Army, and served in Vietnam as a distinguished Bronze Star winning combat medic. I went to Shanklin School and I graduated in, in uh, 54, because the school closed in 55, and all the students that were still there had to move to Robert Smalls. It, it felt it was like family, because all the teachers and everybody's staff that worked at the school live in our communities and go to the same church we did. So it was like family to me. Because when I came from Hilton Head and, and my first day there, I, I thought I was on a college campus. For me, it was a difference because coming from a one room schoolhouse at Hilton Head, you know, and they also taught home economics, farming, construction, and stuff like that. They had from, from six to 12. And Mr. Joseph Shankham and his wife, Ms. Easy Shankham, they were there for running the school. The Chang School was almost like Booker T. Washington School. Booker T. Washington, he was involved in the school from the beginning. And, and I think that him and Mr. Shankin were very close. He is born and raised here, which I think makes him unique in that he has the history. So in his attempts to do good, he has the background. I had the pleasure of being at the dedication ceremony of the athletic complex at Well Branch Early College High School when it was named after Mr. Earl Campbell. It is evident that he's a committed member of the community because of the mass impact that he has made, not only in education, but as just a leader in the community, a role model that others admire and also desire to emulate. He's a dedicated servant leader that's committed not only to the students of the Seabrook community, but entire Beaufort County School District. He is the heart heart and soul of the school board and has been for three decades. The reason I ran for the board was because I had children in the school system and I, I was on PTO, Spool and Food and Council. And so I got involved, you know, in that. Right now, a little over 30. I got two more this year and another year and then I'm going to give it up. He is absolutely committed to this community and to doing good and never 
ever fail and yield in his attempt to do so. Earl Campbell is an accomplished but honest and humble man who doesn't speak loudly, doesn't force his opinions, but when Earl Campbell speaks, everybody stops and everybody listens. I'm, I'm all about education, you know. That's, that's just me. Because my parents brought me that way, my grandparents brought me that way. Mr. Campbell, thank you not only for your military service, but for your educational service on this board for 30 years. We appreciate you very much and all the wonderful work you do. All right, next up is uh, our first public comment. So we'll go in order that they were received. Um, we have several people here participating. Then we also have at least one member uh, via a phone. First is Linda Moyd Hills, who will speak about various concerns. Good evening. I have two concerns. One, hall monitor. Why and what was, why and what was, or is the justification for removing hall monitors from the school? Since the removal of those positions, there are no monitors in the halls to stop the riffraff and the problems that occur with the students. I would like to see the hall monitors back in the school. Who cares about our children education. Voicemail. What is the purpose of a voicemail system if you can't leave a message? On last week Wednesday, I called the Beaufort County School District Office and asked to speak to a Pacific person and was not transferred to the person I wanted to speak to. I was transferred to a voicemail recording that didn't state a name, but wanted me to leave a message. I called back and told the receptionist that I wanted to speak. I wanted to speak to the person with the voicemail. And when she connected me to the voicemail, it was full. So on Wednesday, I decided on coming to the district to speak to the person. But when I got here, the receptionist called that person again, and the voicemail is still full. So to, to this day, I have yet to receive a response from the person that I was trying to get in contact with. Tomorrow will be a week. And really, what is the policy here? Because no county office that I know should carry over voicemail to the next day. So I'm just concerned. Is that what's happening here with everyone? Thank you, and I appreciate your time. And I am concerned. So please get back with me. And I left a copy with the young lady in the back. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you for your comment. Next up, uh, we have Willie Bennett uh, speaking about student voices. Hello, my name is Nellie Bennett and I'm a senior at Beaufort High School. Diversity Awareness Youth Literacy Organization. That is the definition of Bingo, which is a collection of students who have taken the necessary steps to encourage student involvement in this community. In the past, we've spoken to the board only about book bans, but today we're here to speak to you about another topic which, which remains in line with Dale's mission of supporting diversity and empathy in order to strengthen our community. This evening, as the president of Beaufort High, High School's DALO, I would like to ask the board to listen to the voices of county students when considering your support of education legislation that is currently being drafted at the State House. It is our understanding that our state is currently in the middle of a legislative session that is heavily focused on education, and since students are the ones most affected by these decisions, we feel that the board should hear our voices when considering these bills. We would, we would like to specifically ask the board and the school district staff for help in forming a student council that would have a voice in the changes to our education that are being proposed. 
This council would give students voices from all over the county uh, a chance to participate in these discussions about what is best for our education. Currently, we're hearing much talk about parental rights and involvement, but there has been no discussion about the rights and involvement of the students, and why shouldn't there be? This is our education, this is my education, and we deserve a say in the policies that will help shape our education. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you for your comment. Um, next, we have Mary Foster speaking about book challenges. Good evening, I am Mary Foster and I spoke with you a couple of weeks ago during public comments in support of returning books to libraries and classrooms. Thank you for allowing me to speak again tonight and thank you again for all that you do for the students, teachers and parents of Beaufort County. I just wanted to very briefly address you tonight to thank those of you who supported the decisions made by the review committees for the books that have been reviewed thus far. I implore you to continue to trust the process you have laid out for book reviews and these review committees. I sincerely hope we can continue to see the return of these books to the shelves. Though there are many challenges facing students in schools today, I think most of us can agree that access to too many books is not one of them. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Next, we have Mel Campbell. Uh, speaking about education in South Carolina. Good evening. Appreciate your effort as a board, as you well, no. Uh, last time I spoke to you, like a couple of weeks ago, I think I gave a underhanded assignment, a stone or rebellion, and I'm sure somebody looked it up and found out that at the end of the stone or rebellion, all literacy was banned in terms of teaching literacy to enslaved people. That happened in 1740, and it was until 1862 before folks were allowed to have books again at the Port Royal Experiment. That created, of course, a big void in terms of, of intellect, and we are enthralled today in a big argument about who should read what. But not being allowed to read and write for 122 years is impactual. And the residual effect of that still occurs today. And uh, Donald Shanklin School for Boys was no incidence. It was the result of some of the same thing. And uh, we're going to continue to talk about where we were in education in the state and why we are where we are today. Hopefully, we can all agree to come up with a common plan, an agreement to further educate all of the children here in Beaufort County. And that's going to require some innovation. Not so much on like some of the other places in America, but specific to Beaufort County. You know, one room schoolhouses that resolved, they finally uh, dissolved into public schools. That history has to be recognized if you as a board gonna further education in the county today, some of those folks are still being affected by lack of continuation of the process of education. I know you're gonna do the right thing, 
I just want to help you understand what the right thing is by going through the history. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you for your comment. Now, next up, we have Jody Trutek, House Bill 3485, Book Review Committees. I raced to get here, so I didn't really prepare comments. Um, but uh, last board meeting, we had a legislative committee update. And on that update was uh, House Bill 3485, which is uh, the, what do they call it? Parental Rights and Responsibilities Act. Um, and if I recall correctly, Mr. Dallas had asked for a summary, but the bill was too lengthy and complex for a summary, but I have the bill here. It's really, it's not that complicated. Um, most of the things in it are probably already law or things that we're doing already, like getting consent for medical treatment, things like that. Um, one thing that is big, big red flag in this bill is that it would require schools uh, to out gay students to their parents. So. Um, I think the exact language is uh, no, sh nor shall any employee withhold from a child's parent information that is relative to the physical, emotional, or mental health of the child. S such conduct is grounds for discipline to the employee in addition to other remedies provided. Um, so you may be thinking like, well, what's the big deal? Shouldn't a parent know? You know, many of you may be aware that students who are identify as LGBTQ, have a higher incidence of suicide, depression, emotional problems. Part of the reason for that is a lot of these kids are not accepted by their families, which is why they don't want to come out to their parents. So that is why this is a dangerous bill. Um, and I'm not here to condemn the parenting choices of other parents. I think most of us are trying to figure it out as we go and do our best as we can and do what's right for our kids. But there are some people who maybe have ideas that are outside of the mainstream or, or don't really um, have ideas that we would consider to be in the best interest of a child. So this is Eric Porterfield. I don't know. Some of you probably have heard of him. Maybe not. He is a legislator from West Virginia who is known for inflammatory statements. He compared LGBTQ activists to the KKK. Um, and he also gave an on-camera TV interview where he joked about drowning his own children if they ever came out as gay. So there are people in this world who have beliefs like that. And this bill, House 3485, would put our teachers and our, our school staff in the uncomfortable position of being forced to uh, provide information to parents that maybe students wanted to keep private. So I would encourage all of you to not support this bill. Um, and also, please do support the Dalo kids. They want to be involved in this. They've been amazing through this whole process with the school book reviews. Um, and you should listen to them. It's good to see you. Thank you for your comments. So, um, Dr. Rodriguez, before we go on, can somebody help me with my, my mic? I've been told by Ingrid uh, online that I'm faint, can't hear it. Um, so I can probably take one of those, but could somebody assist me so I don't have to uh, do that in the middle of the meeting? No, no way. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, Dr. Rodriguez and staff, thanks for giving me a chance to speak. Um, in regards to the previous speaker talking about parental rights, uh, it's very easy for you to stand up, Jody, and talk about uh, parents not having rights for anything. And you want 
other parents to do what you want to Mr. do. Mr. So. Cook, your comments need to be germane to the board. You do not need to be talking about another public commenter. Please continue okay. on talking to the board. Okay. So in regards to the parental rights bill, those, that just needs to be left alone. Um, it seems that there's a little bit of a, of a problem with the way these books are being reviewed and handled and the appeals are being handled. Um, the board is not communicating with the person that, that does the appeal. And uh, unfortunately, that's why you have the results that you have. Uh, the board, uh, the board has not being able, is not able to um, come up with a reasonable decision and is just rubber stamping everything. And I'm sure you wouldn't do that for finance. And it's hazardous and dangerous to do that with children's lives. And uh, it's, it's interesting how people want uh, others to give up their parental rights except when it applies to their own kid. So the, the bottom line is, is that y'all need to figure out a way to handle uh, this book situation because it's going to get, it's going to go from bad to worse quicker than anyone wants. And I don't think anyone on the board knows what's around the corner with this, but it's, it's snowballing on you right now. And when, when everything comes to light and the truth comes out, there's going to be a whole new board within a year. Just wanted to put that out there for you. So you need to heed your own words and you need to take care of what's going on and you need to protect the kids in the school in regards to these books because right now you're failing at it. You're not even reviewing the appeals. You're not even reading the books. And by law, you actually have to read them in order to make the decision. Have a good night. Thank you for your comment. That's it. Um, concludes our first public comment session. Next up is uh, the chairman's report. The South Carolina School Boards Association uh, has an annual conference in February, and for the past several years, it's been held on Hilton Head Island at the Marriott Hotel. And we had a number of board members attend this year. The uh, four new board members had the new board orientation that is mandated by law. And I, uh, during that same pre-conference uh, period, attended the uh, board chair workshop. Following those pre-conference uh, um, sessions, there was a three-day uh, annual convention, and um, a number of the board members attended the convention. And I've attended now six or seven years, and I really think this convention this year was was one of the best. And I heard several other of the uh, Beaufort. Uh, board members say that as well as uh, board members from uh, around the state. There were three very good uh, general sessions all on motivation, and then they had breakout sessions in uh, for the remainder of the day. And I personally attended uh, topics such as uh, board superintendent relations policy and contracts. I attended a finance sec session. And one of the most interesting was by a former FBI agent who is now the deputy, deputy inspector general of, um, of the state. Uh, and he uh, gave a talk on uh, how, how they recently investigated actually one of the school boards and districts, Riction 2, and a lot of that information of their findings and recommendations is, is publicly available. So um, I think it was a great conference, great for learning, and hopefully uh, make us a more thoughtful, uh, productive, and uh, knowledgeable board members. Now we'll go on to the committee reports, and the chairman for finance and operations is Colonel uh, Dick Geyer, and he'll report on both of the committees. I've got a lot to report on, and what I plan to do is read you the report uh, from each of the committees, and at the end of the report, uh, ask for any questions or comments uh, from the report. The finance committee met on February 9th. We reviewed the following monthly reports, the Board of Education monthly budget report, the November and December $100,000 report, the November and December Transparency Report, an ESSER update with an executive summary of ESSER funds through January 26, 2023. The report also showed a list of ESSER learning loss activities 
and the description of each program, the total allocation, the total expenditures, what was spent, and the balance for each program. The ESSER update include a list of positions that are funded in the ESSER grant, and there are 41 positions. The cost of these positions with benefits is approximately $3,872,789. We had a briefing on the financial services organization chart. The committee reviewed the current organization chart. The chart included technology department and food services. The committee also looked at staffing comparison of peer uh, South Carolina school district finance departments. We compared our finance department with Richland 1, Lexington 1, Dorchester 2, Aiken, and Richland 2. The different areas of comparison were provided in a chart with a ranking of Buford in each of the areas. The 2023 second quarter financial report, general fund revenues, local property taxes at the end of the second quarter of FY23 are reported at $95.2 million or 53%, which is uh, the prior year's allocations were at 50.7, so we are ahead on revenue. Patient notes of approximately 700, or excuse me, $7.5 million was drawn down during October. The total will be repaid in February of 2023. Are at 48.8 million or 41.5% at the end of the second quarter. And the prior year's collections were 40.2, so we are ahead of, of there slightly. Expenditures. Total spending at the end of the second quarter is reported at 132.9 million, or 44% of the budget. At prior year spending was 43.7. So again, we are underspent for half of the year. Other funds, special revenue and EIA funding. Special revenue expenditures were reporting at 60% of budgeted amount, amounts at the end of the second quarter. Prior year's expenditures was at 24.1. The ESSER expenditures in the second quarter amounted to 16.5 million. Debt service fund. Local property tax collections were reported at 46.3 million or 58.1% of prior year collections were at 55.8. So we are our revenue is uh, is higher again in debt service fund. Un outstanding 8% capital projects are 76.5 complete at the end of the second quarter. FY or 2019 referendum projects are at 86% paid and encumbered as of January 21st, 2022. And that completes the Finance Committee report. Are there any questions? Mr. Carlton Dallas. Yes, thank you, um, Vice Chair Geyer. One of the questions that came up in the financial meeting at the uh, School Board Association, which was very informative and helpful for me as a newbie, is the tax anticipation notes. Uh, we asked the question uh, to sort of bridge the gap uh, between when the county provides our funding and to enable the school district to go out and recruiting. The way it's written, it says um, it has to be, the note has to be based on taxes that are coming. My question is for maybe possible further research is, does that limited narrow definition only apply to the primary tax collection to the district? Or can we ask if it can be defined as if we are a secondary or derivative recipient? So it goes to the county first, and then we could still be defined as being 
eligible to receive it, because if that's the case, then that may help us bridge that gap uh, in the spring so we could recruit teachers. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Crosby? I might have to think about that one for a little bit. <laughs> Um, so currently, we use the tax anticipation note for the fall, where our tax revenues are, are uh, virtually non-existent. Um, but our, of course, our teacher salaries and staff salaries are consistent over 26 paychecks of the entire year. So what's left in the fund balance is virtually depleted by October. Um, so you're referring to more of the spring and advancing fund uh, cash flow. So our cash flow is at its highest in say February, um, the end of January, February right now would probably be the highest we would see in the year because we uh, taxes are due in January. So we are at that high point and then we fall uh, gradually throughout the year. Um, so I, the need would have to be demonstrated to have a cash balance in the negative. And we, our balance doesn't go into the negative until November. So I'd have to explore that, maybe talk to you more about it to understand um, but there may be, um, you know, if our if our fund balance is able to increase slightly more, and as our especially as our ESSER funds expire over the course of the next twenty months, we may be in a position to not have to issue a tax anticipation note in future years. Um, this may be our last for a while, as long as our fund balance is able to sustain at a level um, that keeps us in the cash flow in the positive in the October, November, December range then we may not need it at all. But our, the TAN does go directly to the county in our reserves and our bank account, operations bank account is combined with the bank account of the Beaufort County government, as well as many of the other municipalities as well. So I think ours helps to carry the others throughout the uh, county during that hard time as well, so. Thank you, Ms. Crosby. Yes, sir. Dr. Wisniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is in regard to the positions that are funded through the ESSER grant. Um, I'm not sure if all of them that are listed here with the annual cost uh, with benefits at 3.8 million, do they all expire in September of 2024 or are these kind of staggered in expiration date? Um, the ESSER, we virtually expended ESSER 2. Um, and so some of the, um, some of the, positions are budgeted in ESSER 2 when they extended into ESSER 3. Okay. So our belief when we originally committed them that was that they would could all continue in ESSER 3 until the expiration, probably at June 30 of 2024, as we are ro uh, wrapping up the ESSER plan. Um, but we have considered some other options and we're talking about those. We are um, identifying some of the critical needs um, positions are, are that are in here that will need to continue, and there, we have a few options that we're going to be discussing over the course of the next, starting over the next few months and extending through um, through next year. So we're going to look at potentially seeing if there would, might need to be some funding in the in the current year in the next year's budget or other alternative special revenue funding. So there are some discussions to be had. <laughs> so Dr. Uh, Rodriguez would like to comment. I just want to take the opportunity to comment on uh, the state uh, South Carolina Department of Education and uh, those that are overseeing the ESSER funding have uh, sent us a note commending Buford County School District on how we have utilized ESSER funds and how we manage ESSER funds. Uh, and uh, as they go around now, because part of what they have to do is visit and uh, review school districts, uh, programs and projects, uh, one of the things they want to do is to highlight Buford County as a place where they can send others to come and see how we're managing our ESSER funds and what we're doing with, with our ESSER funds and the projects that we have available. I just thought I'd take the opportunity to share that with you since we're talking about ESSER funds. Do a follow up? So, so what I'm hearing, Tanya, and I just want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly, is that you guys in the next couple of months are going to be looking at potentially grant funds and things like that for these positions, as well as operational dollars in our general budget um, to see if we can continue on with all or some of these or whatnot. Yes, we okay. are. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mr. Smith? Um, just to 
actually she uh, we, she now on the same on the, we're on the same page uh, she's a music as they would say uh, my grandma would say <laughs> in terms of these SO funds and these positions um i remember me asking you at the finance committee meeting that we i see a list of people but there were there are more people than was on this list is that correct no sir you have everything oh. those are full-time people okay so so they're, they're, they're okay so they they are no That's more it. Complete list. Okay. We have part-time workers as well, but those are in after-school programs, child care, and so right. on. Okay. Yeah. And my concern as well is that and in terms of going into the budget seasoning and starting to budget, uh, I think it's very important that we have the materials that we need as soon as possible and not, you know, getting closer to that, to that time uh, in, in terms of even preparing for this as well as into what we're going to be budget, what we're going to be budgeting, because I think that these positions are very important. And also uh, just to put the teeth into it, uh, we would like to, I think it would be, be a great, a great idea to have an update on what's uh, being effective and what's working and which positions that we possibly couldn't lose or possibly that would have a, a less, be less detrimental if we did lose. So I think that, that that is very uh, key moving forward so that we can understand um, in terms of going to the taxpayers, uh, if that, that's what needs to be, is we're talking about a referendum and all that. Um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I just think that any way we can shape it, you know, we talk, we're talking about a lot of different things now in terms of taxpayers and hidden taxpayers. So I just think that moving forward, these positions and having the budget information more earlier is, is, is going to be very prudent and very important for us in making our decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd like to go on to the Operations Committee. The Operations Committee met on February 14th, 2023. Mr. Odding presented the request from Jake Reed and Reed Commercial Partners for University Investment LLC, a driveway access easement for the property. Key points, the town of Bluffton has notified the property owner that they would not be able to have access to Hampton Parkway due to the proximity of Raider Drive. Point two, the easement of Raider Drive was donated to the River Ridge Academy project by University Investments LLC in order to form Raider Drive. According to Jake Reed, uh, Beaufort County School District was not charged. Point three, there is a portion of Raider Drive which is shared ownership with the town of Bluffton Fire District that operates the existing fire station adjacent to Raider Drive. This is the section where driveway access is being requested. Point four, the portion of the road following the fire station has a gate and can be locked off as needed. Therefore, I'd like to make a motion that the operations committee recommends to the full board approval of the drive easement at Raider Drive. made the motion about um, the easement for Raider Drive, and then uh, Mr. William Smith second the motion. I would like to ask Robert to come up here and actually point out on the diagram we have exactly what's happening. Bring that diagram up, if you can. If you have the attachment that was um, presented for the Operations Committee. Can't wait till she gets that up. Yep. Okay. Yep. If you can zoom in on that. So what you'll see that curve, if you push it up just a little bit so you can still see. So that curve goes to the intersection of Raider Drive and Hampton Parkway. And what you see up there is the con you see a concrete pad that's a power easement. And that property is kind of in between that power easement and Raider Drive and Hampton Parkway. So they would be placing a driveway. Um, they're onto Raider Drive just below kind of the power easement area. And the town of Bluff, there's a bigger picture, yeah. And so what you see at the top 
on the left, that's where Bluffton Fire is located. And just above that is where we have a gate where we could close off Raider, Raider Drive if need be. Does that, that give you all the information you needed? I, if, um, if you are looking at that picture right there, where where the uh, uh, where Robin's uh, icon or is up near the top there, uh, if you go off that page on the top end, uh, that's there's a gate up there that uh, provides access to River Ridge. So we we could close that gate there uh, is essentially what Mr. Odding is saying and and control traffic beyond that onto the school's uh, campus. Because since the fire station's there, that's a public, mostly a public road anyway, up to the fire station, because they have to be in and out, in and out. That answer? Dr. Wisniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what, if any, concerns are there of the school administration in regard to providing this access? Uh, to be honest, uh, I do I do not know if this has been shared with the school administration. Okay. Um, Madam Chair and just my fellow board members, I'd be more comfortable voting on this if we had feedback from the actual site's administration on how they feel about this. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Um, I, 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 also, I also, I asked the... Um, the, the when we had this meeting, I asked the I believe I'll be back to actually go council or I asked him was there any liability towards the district in making this motion as well in terms of the access or if what we were doing was if we if the traffic level at some point in time was encroaching on their businesses, would that would they see it to be a problem too? And I believe the owner the owner said no, he didn't he didn't see any any problems with that just to give you an update on in terms of me asking the, the question of what, what excuse me what was the guy's name uh it was um jake reed yes because he was on the actual call so i did ask him that and he did uh state that he was definitely be uh, willing to work with us and he had no problems with that but um other than that i just wanted to also put that out there because that well i did think that that was a, a pivot or something but i did thought that that would what was dr Wineski had asked already I thought that that was already uh, done already. So I, that's why I didn't ask that question. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, can I clarify? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the principal or the, the school site's administration, not Mr. Reed's. No, I'm no, but what, what my, my, my point, let me, let me clear up. My point was that that was an important question, but I already thought that that was, I assumed that that was done already. But in terms of making sure that we're protecting the district, that was my question to the other, to the other party. Of, of of this of 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 giving them the um, right away, so that would that would be another key component as well. But I thought that part was done to clarify. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that's a very good question, and we should have asked the principal uh, to comment. Uh, is it a time constraint? Could we could we put this off? Could we postpone this to the next board meeting without uh, having a major problem? I I don't I'm not aware of any reason why you cannot. Okay, therefore I'd like to uh, postpone uh, this motion for the to the next uh, board meeting. Okay, so I think since we had the motion on the table and it was seconded, so we need to so now postponement would take priority to a certain date. So we need to vote on this because if it doesn't pass, then we go back to the motion um, and the initial motion. All right, so the motion and who second this one? The postponement. Okay, Dr. Wisniewski, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'll second that motion. All right, so um, we now need to vote on that. So all those in favor of postponing um, this uh, easement discussion vote until the next uh, board business meeting, please say aye. 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 Okay, any um, uh, nays or abstentions? Sounded like everybody voted yes. So uh, Elizabeth and uh, Ingrid both said yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. yes. Correct. Yeah, it's hard to tell who's speaking. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, 
construction update. Mr. Rob Corman uh, provided an executive summary for projects through January 31st, 2023. And Mr. Corbin should be available. I am. Good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to provide an executive construction update. Uh, long lead times and inflationary cost increases continue to be in counter. Uh, in this month's report, there are three yellow traffic lights that appear. First one is for Robert Smalls International Academy. That slides uh, six through eight. Uh, project manager continues to monitor uh, the previously reported electrical switch gear delivery concerns. I am pleased to report that the previous shipment date of April 13th now has an improved estimated shipment date of March 9th. We'll go ahead and continue to monitor that, but we do foresee the opportunity to return that traffic light back to green here shortly. Uh, next one is for May River High School, slide 12. Uh, that has a yellow light due to concerns that the project manager continues to work and address. And these are potential concerns with the completion of the field house renovation project and the first home football game scheduled for August 18th. Um, the third one is uh, associated with the playground equipment out at Pritcherville Elementary School. Uh, I am pleased to update that the information received from the vendor last week is now indicating an anticipated shipment date uh, prior to the end of February to uh, 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 deliver the, those uh, playground uh, equipment so that the work can uh, be uh, completed. The next update, I'd like to talk briefly about the St. Helena Elementary School gym renovation, that's slide 59. If you recall, we took a stepped approach to address some exterior facade appearance concerns. Over winter break, we completed the pressure washing of the exterior of the building. Uh, that, that did make some uh, good improvements to the exterior appearance but we were interested in getting a cost proposal to paint the brick infill area where the exterior building lettering is located. That proposal has been received, reviewed, and is approved. Ajax Building Company is currently in the process of scheduling this work to take place as soon as possible. And the remaining 8% work for the St. Helena Elementary School gym is the new entry canopy that's scheduled to occur during summer break this coming summer. Uh, talk briefly about some ESSER updates. Um, uh, I will take the time to define what that acronym does stand for. Uh, we, we had it used earlier in tonight's meeting. ESSER once again stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. Uh, we are managing projects associated with HVAC improvements, bipolar ionization, as well as bottle filler projects. For the HVAC project updates on slide 75, the CDs for the HVAC improvements at DESC and Buford High School first floor are scheduled to be issued in the spring of this year. And installations of the new HVAC rooftop units at Hilton Head Island ECC and the second floor HVAC unit replacements at Buford High School are scheduled to be installed during the summer's break as well. Bipolar ionization projects are making good progress. You can see on slide 76, devices are now installed at 21 schools and require the controls to be connected and tested. And that activity is going on as we speak. Uh, installations for the remaining five locations continue to make progress. Uh, for the bottle filler project, slide 77, Installations began the week of January 17th and installations have been completed at three locations so far. Those locations include Buford High School, Ladies Island Elementary, and Ladies Island Middle School. Moving on to slide 83, talk a little bit about the financial mm -hmm. update shown on slide 83. The financial update is being reported with the green traffic light. The uh, current referendum budget, as you can see there, is $375,710,000. The paid and committed funds through the end of January total $327,340,063. That represents just a little bit more than 87% of the budget. 
The paid expenditures through the end of January totaled just under 200 million. Uh, the figure was 199,521,647 dollars, and the remaining available funds, including contingency total, 48,369,937 dollars. Contingency activity in the month of January included the use of $1,467,132. Contingency remaining at the end of January totaled $8,280,527. And our analysis is still indicating that the remaining referendum scopes can be completed with the remaining available funds. Project closeouts uh, for FY 2019, 8% capital projects. There's one project that remains uh, for FY 2020, 8% capital projects. There's seven projects remain. And for the referendum projects, the information is provided on slide 79 to 81. There's 15 uh, closeouts that have been completed to date. And in addition to that, if you reference the attachment three that was provided with the board materials, a total of 103 financial commitments uh, have been completed to date. And those commitments are easily identified by the green shading that's on that uh, financial summary report. And the last item I'd like to uh, speak briefly to is uh, request for proposals, RFPs, and request for qualifications, RFQs, uh, RFP 23012. That's uh, a request for proposals for interested construction managers for the upcoming Hilton Head Island High School addition and renovation project. Uh, responses from interested firms are due this Thursday, February 23rd. And we have an RFQ, Request for Qualifications 23013, and that's associated with uh, onboarding an architect for a new Bluffton Elementary School. Uh, that RFQ is still uh, going through internal routing for approvals, and just as soon as those are all in place, uh, the plan is to uh, post this uh, uh, RFQ uh, as soon as possible. And this concludes my executive construction update. Do we have any questions? Thank, Thank you, Mr. Corbin. Yes, Carlton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Corbin and Mr. Otting and Ms. Crosby and uh, Superintendent uh, Rodriguez, having spent about three and a half years on the clock committee and with all the chaos that occurred globally as well as in domestic supply chains, uh, and the increase in the cost of labor to complete these jobs to come this close to the conclusion of a massive program over 48 months or more and still be with, within sight of coming in on schedule and under budget, particularly as it relates to managing the complexities and the things that are unforeseen in terms of protecting that contingency is one heck of a job. So just wanted to know that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Dallas. Me? Yes, please. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you. And I, I don't know what to say now because Mr. Uh, Carlton Dallas there's kind of stolen my my uh, my oomph here. But actually, picking back right off that, I actually have some concerns. I don't understand what's happening with Hilton Head Island High School Fieldhouse renovation because I feel like we've been waiting for the construction documents for a long time, and they were supposed to come in December. Now they're anticipated in March. And my question is: Is this a cost concern? Is there ongoing dialogue with the schools? Like what, why are we, this thing just keeps surfacing and not getting um, brought forward? I believe Ms. Boatwright that at a recent board meeting, if you give me a minute, I could probably access exactly which one it was. We did bring in a, a, a GMP, Guaranteed Maximum Price Amendment for that renovation of the Field house uh, at Hilton Head Island High School, and that will allow us to uh, move forward with ordering long lead items and uh, allow the, the construction manager the opportunity to buy out the subcontractor's uh, proposals as the designer is finishing up the design on the, the renovations there. So I think 
you know, your concerns are noted, uh, but we do have that project moving forward. And from the project manager's perspective, he is closely managing that completion of that field house renovation so that we don't conflict with that first scheduled home football game. So am I conflating then the new field house and the renovation? And that's why it seems like, cause I know we had the renovation, yeah. but I thought, and there is something I'm trying, I don't have the paper to flip through here, but on um, the Helton Head High School phase three, 100% CDs for remaining safety, security, and athletic phase three scopes are being scheduled to be received in March, 2023. So is that the new field house? Cause that's what apparently was due in December and hasn't come forward yet. Yes, you're correct. It's the uh, uh, renovation. Or the, what, what has come forward is the renovation portion of that work, the remaining athletics, which includes the new field house. That, that, that is the construction documents that are being wrapped up. So are those documents based on cost, ongoing discussions with the design team? What, what's holding up the um, CDs for the new field house? The the documents just have not reached a point where we feel uh, comfortable along with the designer of record in calling them a hundred percent construction documents. We are close. And uh, as you'll see in the monthly update, it does detail when we're expecting the CDs. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Absolutely. Review two administrative regulations. I'm going to read both uh, of the regulations and then ask if there's any questions or comments uh, after that. Uh, we reviewed SS 57, random drug testing of students. Mr. Carlos Cave, the district athletic director, provided information and updated the committee on changes to SS 57. We also looked at HRS 54. Unencumbered time for teachers. Ms. Alice Walton shared that this is a new administrative regulation. Unencumbered time must be defined as 30 minutes during the regular workday where eligible teachers are afforded time that is self-directed without assigned duties or responsibilities, including direct instruction or supervision of students. Any questions about those two uh, administrative regulations? Mr. Carlton Dallas. So I, I have um, one, I won't say it's a question, but it's a comment on the uh, administrative regulation SS57, uh, the random drug testing. It was explained during the committee why we don't trust the whole student body, and I, I respect that. Um, maybe as we go forward, there can be some consideration of uh, revisiting the fact that a first positive test results in nothing in terms of any punitive outcomes. And a lot of times things like that start small. And if there can be at least something that lets that person know we care about you, we're supporting you, but you have to take corrective actions it would be worthwhile. Other than that, I'm fine. Mr. Smith. Actually, um, in terms of, uh, I think that to me, my question is how much how much does it cost in the district? What are what are we getting out of it? And also, um, I still think that it could be a slippery slope, and it it, it could harm kids uh, due to due to certain facts of, for instance, we for for instance, a kid could be going through a, getting a college scholarship. And once once we have told that kid if they have failed it, that they can't play that sport, then you, we might not tell the college indirectly that that kid couldn't play the sport because of a drug test. But the college going to know if you got a star quarterback and the star, and the star quarterback is pulled from that sport, they know he just didn't up and quit. Some some news I'm sure is going to get around and that could be damaging to that to that student. And as well, I just remind, just re put a reminder out there as well is that I believe that if you have staff members that have that that you that use drugs, that you don't have the right to fire them anymore. So you know you have to come up with the, you have to offer them help and get them help. 
So I'm just in a little concern of what this may bring. And I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I hear us testing students, but I, I'm just got, like I said, I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with testing students and I would like to know in the future how, how much commerce is going to cost and how far are we really trying to go with this? Because uh, this to me, this could all open up Pandora's box. We talk about books now. It'd be piss testing next. Thank you. Ingrid. Thank you. Um, and uh, I had a couple of things on this. One, um, I did go back and watch the meeting. Um, and uh, there were several references to HIPAA. And I brought this up before, but I think it's important that parents recognize this is not protected by HIPAA. This is protected under FERPA, and that needs to be clear. And FERPA has a lot of similarities and does have privacy protections, but there are some significant differences um, between FERPA and HIPAA. And so I think that the staff, unless someone has information that I'm not privy to, but I've, I've researched this pretty hard, um, we should not be telling people that this is protected under HIPAA. Um, FERPA is layers exemptions for law enforcement. And in addition to which, if records, there's an accidental disclosure under FERPA, there's no requirement for anyone to be notified um, like there is in HIPAA. And those are some of the substantial differences. Um, there is, uh, in my opinion, a lot less protection. So I think people need to be aware of that. Um, in addition to which, I'm just going to come out. I know this is an AR and we're just here to be informed, but I'm strongly uh, opposed to suspicionless drug testing, which is what this is. It's, it's called random, but you can actually test any student in a school with reasonable suspicion. This program says that no matter what anyone's doing, any, you know, any student that's involved in a park that can park their car is involved in any kind of theater or athletics can be pulled out of their class, taken down the hall and have to, to go to the bathroom with a monitor. Um, and I, as a parent of someone who's had this happen to their child and it, the, it, the results were fine, it is not benign. To the students. But the main reason I am strongly opposed to uh, the suspicionless drug testing program is that it has been proven over and over and over again under study after randomly controlled study to not have any effect on drug use. So it is expensive, it is demonstrably ineffective, and it is not a benign um, intrusion on uh, students. So I just wanted to say my piece on that. Thank you. Mr. Earl Kimball. I, I just want to say this. Um, I think it have a lot of effect on students. If you want to play sports in, in this district, and I've seen the, the, the attitude of students have changed since this policy is put in place. Uh, you know, and if you don't want to want to take a drug test, then you don't you don't you won't play in the sports. You know, it's not it's not a guarantee that you should be a football player, a basketball player. That's the choice you make. And if you, if you graduate from high school and go to college, they'll do the same thing, you know? So I think we don't need to be making excuses for students, for anybody. Um, we, we know that there is a, a drug problem in this country, but nobody is talking about um, how we're gonna solve the problem. All we do, we blame everybody else, blame the cartel, blame everybody else. We should be discussing how to treat these students and anyone, not only students, but anyone that get on drug, have a drug problem. And we're not talking about that. Thank you. Chloe Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if it's appropriate, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, could we bring Mr. Carlos Cave up because I know that he has been instrumental in this process so that he can give a clarity, some clarity about why they drug test and why they drug test athletes. Having been there, um, I agree with Mr. Cam with Mr. Campbell. It does have an impact. It really does because these are children and they're coming to school high, drunk or whatever. We still have a, you know, responsibility. So I'm just going to ask Mr. Cave if he would share some light on this to the board. Thank you. So good evening. Um, very briefly, this policy was adopted back in 2015, June of 2015, revised 
February of 2016, again, January of 2018, and again, September of 2019. This would be uh, another revision to the policy. This policy was put in place um, to offer testing because of what at the time was an issue with uh, drug use. Um, that board at that time, under the leadership of that superintendent, saw fit to uh, look into this policy and, and thus put this policy in place. Um, I do understand uh, the concerns with the first positive test, but the first positive test means that you are ineligible for extracurricular activities for a year, unless you, the parent uh, of that student athlete or student participating in extracurricular activities um, are able to uh, give their son or daughter registered in a program to initiate some type of treatment process. So there is punitive uh, uh, punishment on the first uh, uh, positive test. Uh, the option of that leniency comes with them being registered. Um, as far as this policy goes, um, we are one of three districts as of 2017 uh, in the state. Anderson 5 uh, offers this uh, testing. Of course, we offer it, it and I think it is Lexington, Lexington, Lex 5. Um, I think it's Lex 5. Um, so th this is something that has been put into play that impacts extracurricular, but it also impacts the overall student population because any parent, if they deem the need, can opt their son or daughter into the program. So it does encompass the entire student population. That option is available for all parents if they see fit or see the need to have or take part in this program. This program is random. Names are submitted to the testing agency by each individual school. And that testing group then selects a percentage of those random names. Um, this process, again, being revised and taking the testing to a, a local group through the mutual agreement that the district has signed. Uh, allows for the the whole process of treatment and and working with the parents. Um, this part will will be a what I would deem to be a better uh, situation versus what the district has had in the past. With the with COVID, this is not taking place uh, for probably the last three years. I know this senior class would not have been a group of athletes and or students in extracurricular that would have been tested. Um, so this is new coming back to the district. Basically, we were rolling this out again, brand new. Um, so I understand the concerns of the board. As I've stated in our leadership meetings, what I would like to see happen is that we do a PR campaign to truly explain what this process looks like. Again, this is not something that we'll put in place to be punitive uh, and to, to really target kids. It is merely a way to to help parents help their sons and daughters um, if they do perceive them with a problem or if they don't know that they have a problem and we're able to to help them in, in giving them the information. Um, I, I, I just feel like uh, with where we are as a district, um, this this policy is not detrimental is one that could be beneficial to parents as well as uh, the uh, administrators and all of our buildings that will be participating in this program. Thank you. Um, Ms. Boatwright? Yeah, let me just respond. I understand why it seems like it would be effective, but what I'm telling you, if you look, there have, there's a study of 76,000 students was conducted and they found no difference in drug use between those schools that, and not only not only drug use, but perceptions of drug use. Um, and the many groups are against this as a privacy violation. So I understand that it feels like it would be, but the data does not support it. It costs anywhere from 15 to $30 a test. The average positive rate is one in 125 tests, which means that on average, 
you're going to spend, oh, somebody do the math for me. Where's Mel when we need him? Um, you know, thousands and thousands of he's dollars. Here. <laughs> there you go, Mel, Actually, what is it? Room. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it is expensive. A lot of groups, including like the ACLU, et cetera, et cetera, and some other more conservative parent right groups are against this policy. And I can tell you that the students find it really offensive and humiliating. So while I, I, would, I would encourage the board members to actually look at the studies that have been conducted on a large scale and look at the data and look at how much money we're spending on students who generally are considered, you know, that the students involved in extracurricular activities are generally at lower risk from drug use to begin with. That's, that's a, a study result. And we're spending lots of money. Are there other ways? I acknowledge that there's a drug problem, but are we spending that money in the most um, effective way? So um, I'm happy to send some of these studies, but having, I had a child that had to go through a drug test. She found it humiliating and discouraging, even though she was not concerned about a positive result. I think we need to talk, this would be something great to bring up with the student advisories, because I think this, when I've talked to pe young people about this, they're shocked that someone could pull you out of a class for no reason other than you're on the swim team or you're in a play and make you go down to the bathroom with the hall monitor with some sort of monitor and do this formal drug testing policy. So I think that'd be a great thing to talk to the student advisories about. And I do think there are a lot of, there's a lot of research done on this. Uh, Carlton Dallas. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Just speaking in general, um, massive corporations do random drug testing. I, as a pretty doggone senior executive, could be random drug tested. And so once that's known, you can, you can sort of believe that behaviors change. And when I look at the occurrences of uh, enforcement issues, uh, I think we have to take something very aggressive to make sure those uh, teaching classes are safe. And this is a precursor. This type of activity tends to grow over time. And I, the best example I can give is if any of you have visited New York City back in the 80s, it was a horrible place. Melvin Bratton came in and he didn't just start with the big crimes. He started with the small crimes, cleaning up the subways. And that creates a culture and an awareness that, okay, they're paying attention and it's not going to be allowed. So I'm all in favor um, of actually having maybe an edit. I didn't see it when I read it, so I probably read it too fast, but says that if there is a positive test, that there is what was mentioned by, Mr. by uh, Athletic Director Cave. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, actually, he did mention that at the um, uh, he did mention that at, at the uh, at the operations committee meeting. I believe that did come up uh, within the first time, but also just to um, talk about a more tougher consequence. You know, we have, I think once again, why says a slippery slope is because in say South Carolina, you can't deny a kid education. So when you, when you get too tougher, if a kid is doing drugs, sometimes nine times out of ten, they may they may be a problem. So now you're talking you're talking about you're talking about your dropout rate. You're talking about a kid not being in school or a kid getting frustrated. Then you might be uh, you you might be helping that kid make that decision whether it's go to school or quit. So so once again, this drug testing thing I think is bigger than some of us see it to be when you have some kids. The sports or different things are their only outlet. That's what keeps them in school. And that's what keeps them engaged. When you take that from a kid, then what? Prisons. It's what's next. Graveyards. It's what next. What's next? I'm not promoting the kids. I'm not promoting kids to do drugs. But what I won't promote them either is the mental, the mental stability and, and, and being that, that that's real. A lot of kids are dealing with those things and, and they're not getting the necessary help. I would like Ms. Boris, I wouldn't mind putting money into those programs and helping them get that help that they need and allowing them to come forward. <laughs> so I mean that's just some of my some of my thoughts when it comes to that. I'll just leave that there. Thank you. Dr. Wisnetsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask for clarification. Does this um AR cover performance enhancing? drugs like steroids 
No, it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Thank you. Facilities master plan. The committee reviewed the facilities master plan. Carol Crutchfield provided the provided the plan with to the committee. Uh, the documents currently on the website. Hard copies are being printed, and the book is divided in the following areas: programs, demographics, and student assignment, facilities, and land use, which is a new uh, part of the document. Moving on to OE8 facilities. Mr. Robert Odding presented OE8 facilities for acceptance. He presented data for each of the components of OE8. The committee had concerns with the wording of in policy OE8. The policy states the superintendent shall ensure that physical facilities support the accomplishment of the board's results. Policies are safe and properly maintained. The committee would like to recommend that this OE go back to the policy committee and the word secure be added to the policy. So it would read, the policies are safe and secure, which is an additional piece. And the committee recommended that it be put in the consent agenda uh, for review, but that be referred to the policy committee for action. Second. Well, we already had it removed from the consent agenda um, by Ms. Boatwright at the beginning of the meeting. Right. And sorry, point of order. Were we not going to do this on board business action? I thought that's where we yes. put it. I just made the but, report. We can okay. Yeah, but Colonel Geyer just made the report. So how about we, since we, we wait until we get to the board business, since right. it's no longer under... Um, consent agenda. Okay, I'm with you. And the last, the last uh, item of business was the FOIA annual report. Actually, I do have something before you move on for, with that. Are you ready for questions, or would you like to finish? Uh, I, I, okay. You, you, Go ahead. Um, just in, in reference to the book um, that he that Colonel Geyer just uh, uh, Mr. Geyer referenced. Um, <laughs> My thought was on that book, and I did thank the staff on their hard work along that book. But when I first came onto this board, uh, Beaufort City had a workshop where you, we were invited, and that had the the actual some of these same plans. And basically, the plans basically to it was the city how much the ten year plan or whatever it was. But basically, a lot of community key members and different community members were brought in, and they were shown the plan and what is going on and to be a stakeholder, basically the stakeholders. And I think that this is this book is a great is a great tool. But the, the question becomes too, I think it's more better served when people in the community can they come in and have input and understand and digest this book and understand the information in this book and have a conference, a, a successful dialogue in the, this information that we are continuously gathering because the book and this and the time that the staff is putting in this book is is, is not a little bit and it, it, it costs a lot. So I, I think is 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 to have a book on the shelf with that much information and to understand it, to have the community understanding it and buying into it, is more is 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 is, is, is more fruitful than just coming up with coming with coming up with the book and we and the board and the superintendent understand what's going on and certain entities. Who may know about the book? They may utilize that. I think. I think it's. I think it's more important for everyone to use that to use this tool going forward. That's just something I, I gave to to uh, the staff, and they, they were they received it. But I just want to reiterate that and make sure that it is something that we're looking forward to. I think that's a great thing to do. Continue on the OE sixteen FOIA annual report, uh, Doctor Bruder. Are you going to present, you're going to give a brief update on that report? No, it's still under the consent agenda. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. Let's have a brief, just a brief report because we are going to be voting on it.
Good evening. So thank, thank you. you. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, so yes, we did present the um, FOIA report for this past year. Um, we've had an increase um, in FOIAs, um, and we have been um, doing our best to keep up with that. And we um, we have also is part of the report, we wanted to let you know that we are grouping some of our FOIA requests um, that come in within a similar time frame. Um, and we are we do charge for some of our FOIA requests given the increase that we have had in them as of late. And do you have any questions? Yeah. Any questions from any board members? Oh, thank you. Thank you. That thank concludes you. the operations committee report. Thank you, Colonel Geyer. So next up, we have um, the superintendent's report, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, in the superintendent's report, we're going to provide uh, uh, information around state school update. This is uh, information document uh, or information, excuse me, that the State Board, uh, not State Board, the State Department of Education mm -hmm. has provided uh, to school districts in reference to 2022 um, and an additional impact of COVID uh, on, on schools. And so, uh, Dr. Stratos. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Good evening, Matt, Madam Chair. This evening, I am sharing information as it relates to the state embargoed school accountability classifications. These classifications of su are subject to the 2021-2022 state testing. Let me begin by sharing. If you go to the beginning of the document, thank you, Mrs. Cushenberry. I want to begin by sharing the COVID impact on learning. The, ons the onset of the pandemic has resulted with the greatest generational disruption of education in our lifetime. The 2020 onset of a pandemic brought the close of a school year with three months of unfinished learning. And the learning gap continued as families chose to keep their most prized possessions home, their children. As schools are provided the option to reopen in many communities, parents preferred virtual learning rather than face-to-face -face classroom learning. Adding to this, as school districts started to, to define a new normal, school schedules were modified to address the health and safety and required quarantines by the Department of Health and Environmental Control, as DHEC. That resulted with an impact on teachers, students, and families. At the closing of last year across the nation, school districts developed a heightened awareness of the long-term impact of the pandemic upon student learning and their well-being. Although the 2021-2022 academic year ended on a high note, outdoor in-person graduations, high school proms, and full access to in-person learning for most students, during, during the school year, still experienced 10-day quarantines for students and teachers. Families refrained from enrolling children into pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, and overall, the past three years have been the most challenging for educators and students in our nation's history. Looking into current day, there are, there are predominance of elementary students who have missed the educational foundational years who are now seated in fourth grade. Research has shown that the initial annual impact of the pandemic on K-12 student learning was significant leaving students on average five months behind in mathematics and four months behind in, in the reading by the end of 2020. To add the long-term impact of this gap has been defined to have a lasting three-year impact upon learning. In fact, the U.S. Secretary of Education has stated that the impact upon mathematics is estimated to have a negative impact for decades. So what I have in front of you right there is just a quick step to get an idea. You see 2020 was the onset of COVID-19. If a student was in first grade, or let's just say second grade, they were just getting, getting the foundations of learning at elementary. Where would they be now and look at the interruptions of their education? So that's what the steps just share for you. If you look further down at Roman numeral two, it gives you national data points 
as measured by iReady, I reading and math. The first graph is the 2021 school year, gives you information on math and reading. And these are national end points by race, by income, and by location. If you go to the following page, Roman numeral two, national data points. This is sharing the initial impact on learning. You see the blue line that is during COVID the growth. The black line is actually the historical growth. As we look at Roman numeral three to catch up to current school accountability classifications through COVID, as a result of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, ESSA, and amended by the Every Student Succeeds Act, States are required to have developed an accountability system. A state's accountability system includes multiple indicators, each of which illuminates a different facet of school performance or quality. So what you have in front of you at this time at Norman Number 4, I will start with the Comprehensive Support and Imp Improvement Schools. That is a federal classification. If you follow down to the next, it is a priority school is a classification that is a state classification. The last box in that graphic shows you this is based on the performance of the entire school. If you look to the graphic to the, uh, to the right, what we know as ATSI or, or in fully written out additional targeted support and improvement, that again is a federal classification. If you follow the arrow to the next, this is a targeted support and improvement consistently underperforming schools. We have not had any classifications of TSI at the last onset of classifications. If you know what I have in parentheses identified, these came out as of November 2020. Again, this is a federal classification. These classifications on the right side are based on subgroup performance. A subgroup consists of 20 students. So what I try to do to keep it in my brain is anything with an I is federal. CSI, ATSI, and TSI. The priority is a state designation. Your designations, when it comes to overall schools, it is ranked in order to the state. You have a 10% cutoff and a 5% cutoff mark in rank and order. Remember, subgroups are 20 students within a school ranking that are performing at a lowest area. If you go to the point, thank you. So at this time, for Beaufort County School District, Comprehensive Support and Improvement Schools, we have one school identified, that is Robert Smalls International at the elementary school. I want us to recognize that Robert Smalls consists of two schools. We keep thinking it is a K-8, but the state designates them as an elementary and middle school for classification purposes. Priority schools, we have been identified with two, Buford Middle, and Royal Branch Elementary. I'd like to pause at this moment for us to also recognize our two prior priority schools are no longer in ranking. That is, Dr. Watts, thank you. That is significant. That is through a pandemic, through putting systems in place, fidelity of practice by leadership, and hard work of our educators. Both those schools, that is Whale Branch Middle School, as well as Hilton Head Middle School, are no longer on the state list. Alpha C, additional tar targeted support and improvement schools. If you look down, there is a list. They are identified for three years. And I'd like to share that all these schools in Alpha A, B, and C have a three-year cycle of being identified. The state just released these identifications. We are already in that first year cycle. So we are now, as the state has just released it, so that throughout the state, we're a little behind. And TSI schools, as I shared, the targeted support at the time it is Friday, and I have checked once, twice, three, five times, we have no classifications. And I like to share that the TSI is a warning. It is 
be careful, keep an eye out, be aware that these sub subgroups are not performing. This is a quick summary of our current status, and I'm open for questions. Dr. Wisniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Stratos. Um, this is something that, you know, I think a lot of us have heard about is the, the divide that has occurred and also the, the learning loss that's occurred due to the pandemic. Um, I was looking back at our ESSER funds update that we just had previously mm -hmm. in the board meeting, and I'm interested to know if there's any plans or any conversations going um, in regard to, because I could look at page six and see a couple million dollars sitting there. And I know I always tend to harp on the summer programs and how many more kids can we bring in and serve. Um, I'm really hoping that there's a summer plan that's being worked on that's going to help to work at these schools as a priority, um, but across all of our schools. And I'd love to see a substantial summer program this coming summer to try to address that learning loss and capture those kids. Um, we've we've got the funds there to do so, I think. Um, whether it be that we offer, I know teachers want their summers off. I know that's definitely a thing. If we're offering them um, an incentive in the form of pay that is competitive to a summer job, um, I think that we would have more that came up and we're more than willing to do the work during the summer. I think it's also important to note that um, through utilize, utilization of those funds, um, we have extended learning sites that we also have in play uh, to support the needs of, of students, you know, on an ongoing basis, Not, but to I should say to target the needs of students uh, in an ongoing basis uh, throughout the year uh, so that so that we don't just have to rely on a couple of weeks or four weeks or, or what have you in the summer in order to try to to make that acceleration happen. We're trying to we're trying to hit on that uh, along the year uh, throughout the year uh, along the way as much as possible too. So that's that's an addition to what you're suggesting. Yes, sir. I've I've praised you guys on that work as well because my one of my daughters was at one of those after school programs. Um, I'm concerned about the summer months where you already see yep. um, loss every year with kids, um, and I'm hoping that maybe we could do an extended summer program or something. We're we're just pushing as much of those resources that we have at our fingertips to the kids to try to make up for some of the gap. I know we're not going to be able to do anything perfect, but like you said, people are looking at us of how we spend our ESSER dollars. So put our money where our mouth is. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Um, Dr. Scott, did I hear you said that we had two schools that are no longer in the uh, in this category anymore? Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> with with that, um, I am still. I am. I am. I am definitely. Let me say, point that out that I am definitely proud of them for their hard work and their effort that they have done, and it's much appreciative. Uh, kudos to them and their staff for working. And you, your work is not going to notice. On the on the other note, I've seen some of these. I see some schools on here that has been in this situation prior to COVID, and the question becomes, what are we going to do about that? Because we can't continuously just have these schools in, in this situation, and we're saying, well, due to COVID, COVID is one thing. But to have schools who've made it out during COVID proves that it can be done. My work, my let, let the work I've done speak for me. The work in black and white speaks louder than I plan up. I'm trying or I'm working on it or I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. It's not good enough. And my community has been talking about this long enough and for a very long time. And other and other communities too. And some of these schools are, are, are on there that, that mm -hmm. was on there that was on there previously or in trouble. I'm hoping, not even hoping. I'm looking along with the, along with community members. We're looking for an intensive plan on what how to call and say on, on, on what the the outcome of uh, the outcome is from leadership on down. So I mean, it's it's it's, 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 very, it's very important that they say if you keep doing the same thing over and over. That's insanity. Mm. I ended there. 
Yes. May I Go thank ahead. you? And Mr. Smith, thank you for bringing it forward the fact of an intensive plan. That is a requirement for a CSI school and priority school. They have to undergo a significant SWOT analysis, a root cause analysis, and have a detailed plan that has to be reviewed and approved by the state. At this time, we're waiting for the guidance from the state. Our state meeting is Friday morning to share that. But I also want to bring forward some of the schools that we see on lists. Let's take into account the amount of attend absences or students who were out of school or families who chose during COVID and close it to remain on virtual versus face-to-face. -face. It has had a negative impact on the student at, at learning, and we did share that. You bring forward some of the, fit, like the next steps of what we are doing. I have to say we've already conducted two focus groups to, to look into a deep analysis. Looking at internal, external cause, is it something that we have control of? Is it something that we don't have control of? Then going into the thematic identification of these barriers that we're seeing for learning to identify them either as systems, culture and climate, leadership, or as instructional. We're in that deep process right now through academic cabinet, which is a process that Dr. Rodriguez has put in place that we meet every Monday. And we're spending a large amount of time in that, including bringing our principals. So I, I have to share that this is a process we started actually a little before the state when we were monitoring. And now that they've un unembargoed the data, we're into a deep, deeper root cause analysis so we can start defining better support. We have put in place already a stronger data analysis that I shared about at our last board meeting on that database, where we can dig deeper into the needs of our students. We have the extended learning programs, and we've also have put in place a stronger summer program. We already are starting to recruit and hire for summer. I appreciate your recommendation. Um, that would be something for another time for conversation. So we're trying to take action early because we don't want to do the same thing with that, keep with the same results understood. I would add that um, the process instituted around instructional reviews is an ongoing process, and it is focused on uh, looking at specific instruction and how that instruction aligns with the state standards that students need to know and be able to do or master, uh, which is ultimately what they are assessed on. So it's focused on standards-based instruction and it's focused on uh, an internal review at schools uh, during the course of, of the year. So initially uh, all schools receive one uh, and then in the mid-year uh, specific targeted uh, uh, schools receive additional uh, instructional review. Uh, so there are systems in place and process in place to keep a monitor and to keep a, a focus on that work uh, uh, to work towards continuous improvement. And that's what it's all about. It's about continuous improvement. Identify, improve, identify, improve, identify, improve. Um, and, and in addition, I think uh, when you look at uh, the majority of uh, identified here, uh, it's, it's typically related uh, to uh, uh, in the area of SPED, and and that's an area that we focus on uh, in order to to uh, provide additional supports around around SPED. One of the challenges we face with SPED is a challenge that exists nationwide, and you all see it uh, the second meeting of every month uh, when we look at vacancies and and discuss that information with you all, and you see. Uh, the the challenges that schools and school districts face, including our own, with respect to uh, SPED vacancies uh, and, and trying to target and improve upon that area. But that is a critical piece uh, in terms of that quality, uh, high quality instruction. And so there is a significant uh, shortage of educators, but an even greater significant shortage of SPED educators uh, in, in, in the United States. And that's one of those challenges that, that we're looking and working hard at trying to overcome, but it's a reality that we face. So. Um, other uh, members speak, Mr. Victor Ney. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I understand, uh, the schools can be on one of these lists uh, because one or more subgroups are, are low performing. You mentioned that a subgroup could be 20 kids. Yes, sir. So you're saying that a school could be on this list with hundreds of students in the, in the school with as many as as little as 20 kids. So it's 20. Go ahead. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, if 
that's the way you describe that. That is a possibility. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Mr. Carlton Dallas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stratus, for helping explain. I really appreciate that. I sort of personally um, really sort of feel for the teachers, hmm. because if you look at the supply chain of humans from birth to five, that kid that their parents read to has a head start. And so what can we do from a cultural perspective as a community to help teach parents before that kid even gets to school that you need to read to that kid? How can we leverage churches, uh, social institutions, sororities, fraternities to help those parents who may not be aware of that, of how instrumental, how critically important that first five years is? And then I think the teachers, I'm impressed by the number of programs that the school district has, but it's if by the time that youngster gets to the school doors, um, if they haven't been sort of, the culture hasn't been to sort of teach that youngster, boy, that's a, that's a heck of a challenge for the school district to, to ascend. I'm not saying it's not noble and worthwhile, just saying that I think we need to help the communities know what they can do. I think, um, uh, Mr. Dallas, I think, you know, you're exactly right on on the critical piece. Uh, I'll share with you, and because I've, I've said it, I've said it before in the past. But one of the challenges is that kindergarten is not compulsory mm -hmm. in South Carolina. So, so that's not a that was foreign to me because where where I came from, uh, it was a requirement. But I but I do think that uh, there's value in that as we as we speak with our legislators legislative delegation in terms of supporting a compulsory kindergarten piece. It's possible that a student doesn't arrive in a school setting until first grade. And if that happens in kindergarten, you're learning in, a, in essence, uh, the, the rules of school, how does school function? You know, you're learning, you're, you're being read to, you're, you're learning, uh, learning to read, right? Uh, First grade is critical literacy instruction for students. And if that's your first entrance into, uh, into a school system, you know, uh, you miss the benefit of that, that first year component. So just an interesting uh, side note as we, as we engage and deal with uh, possibilities around legislation with, with legislators, that's an important piece. Dr. Wisniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you, you made me think of something, um, Mr. Dallas, I just wanted to share that might be something that we could build upon. But um, I delivered my my oldest daughter at Hilton Head Hospital. And one of the things that I received That's as a the mother was a book mm -hmm. and information about how early literacy yeah. is very important. So I don't know if they're still doing that. That was almost 12 years ago. Yeah, we are. I also had two daughters at Savannah Memorial, and I don't recall them doing yeah. it over there. So um, just something to think about if we could uh, build upon. One of the things that's, uh, you know, important too. you, you look around in communities and you see a lot of uh, uh, lending libraries that are out there. I can tell you my, because my son has a, uh, just received his Eagle Scout and that was his project was to build a learning library two learning libraries uh, for community. And uh, so I know he, I know he placed one in the Whale Branch community uh, as an example. And, and I think that is important because you try to get access to books uh, closer to students. Um, you know, that's an important piece. So. Um, Chloe Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Stratus, your team and also team of educators. Um, listening to my colleagues here today, I was coming in to town and I saw a big blue bus, right? And it was in uh, a community and I believe it was a, a reading. A mobile library. A mobile yes, library and uh, where kids could come and uh, get books, get introduced to books, whatever. And I was so excited as an adult. Uh, I wish I had had time to stop, but I do know that there are programs that this district has 
worked on diligently uh, to promote our children and to get them ready. Uh, I know that there is a program for early childhood. Yes, ma'am. That you identify these children and make sure that they get what they need. I say that to say, when you talk about the extended programs, summer programs, and especially our children who are identified in school that need that uh, extended learning process, it's in place. Um, but I would like to see the teachers who are teaching the summer programs to get compensatory, some more pay or whatever, because uh, it is an extension of their time as well. I think and sometimes we forget that teachers have families too. So while we are keeping them that summer and they are volunteering <laughs> uh, to work the summer programs, it is also times that they could share and spend time with their kids. So there are a lot of programs and, and this administration and others before are to be commended. My concern is in looking at, and I think Dr. Rodriguez mentioned our special needs students and you know how we uh, look at that so it's special ed programs, but those teachers, if you've never gone to an IEP meeting and look at what these special needs teachers have to go through, uh, not only with their daily uh, teaching activities, but getting ready for the meeting, processing the paperwork, getting it out, making sure it's correct. Uh, that's an additional load that the other teachers don't have, but they get the same pay. And so maybe we could look at maybe giving some kind of compensatory uh, pay for uh, special needs teachers because it's it's a difficult task uh, every day for them, not teaching the kids. But I'm just saying the paperwork, the paperwork, the paperwork. So as we're looking at the different committees that you have, and they are too because I do know that Dr. White and her staff and everyone. Um, I think that this district does uh, in terms of trying to get these children ready, trying to keep them ready. And yes, we've been impacted by COVID and I don't think we can dismiss how we were impacted. Even the businesses have been impacted, the stores, employees. Uh, so I think our, our board uh, has a task and along with our superintendent and his people but I think parents have a kid. And sometimes we forget that they're the ones who get the little kids to the school. Kids don't drive themselves, not the five-year-olds, not the six-year-olds. But I think this district has also reached out to parents. I know you've had programs to reach out to them uh, to educate them about the processes and we probably need to go back and revisit. I'm saying a lot to say, we still have our work cut out. We do have issues like most districts do, but I do think that we're taking the right approach. No one is stepping away from that responsibility uh, to give the teachers what they need. And I think that we really need to really look more at what they, what they need uh, in terms of educating our kids. Dr. Rodriguez. Ms. Gordon, uh... Thank you for your comments. You know, all of your board, all of the board members, thank you for your comments. Um, you know, one thing that I will, uh, I will say and stress, and I'm going to uh, I'll say I'm going to steal a page from Mr. Campbell's book, um, but I guess it's your book and it's all your books as well. And that is to say that uh, we have, uh, uh, programs, we have initiatives, we have lots of things in place, um, but school district can't do this alone. And that's what you're all alluding to uh, in your comments as well. And Mr. Dallas, you know, you highlighted different community groups that uh, we can connect with or that can lend a hand in, uh, in the initiative and in the work uh, that, that's out there. There are uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, extended learning sites that are lending a hand, that are stepping in, that are are doing that work. Uh, but parent engagement uh, is 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 an important part. Uh, support uh, and continued support uh, from parents is important to us in carrying this work out. Um, and uh, I've got uh, a couple of initiatives that I'm working on uh, to do two things. One is uh, uh, to identify uh, and work through, well, I've identified a way, but but working through and laying out some plans on taking that engagement to another level uh, for us, uh, which, you know, is going to require some compensation for, for the people that I'm going to call upon to do it, because I'm going to call upon them to do some of this after hours, right? Uh, but in addition, uh, making sure that every child in our system that has to take a state assessment, I'm going to say becomes assessment literate. Assessment mm -hmm. literacy is such a thing. And in assessment literacy, you look at why am I taking this test? What does this test mean? What does this test mean for me? What does this test mean for our school? What are this? What is this diagnostic assessment? What is this iReady assessment that I'm taking? Why am I taking these assessments? So that it's not just about taking an assessment that satisfies a state requirement on an assessment or that satisfies a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a district initiative to try to help improve achievement, but it puts them in command of their own learning. And I think that's powerful. If kids understand why they're doing this, why they have to take these assessments, why the, how these lessons that they receive from their, from their awesome teachers in our school system uh, connect to those assessments that they're taking, uh, then I think it empowers them to be in command and in control of their own learning as well. And, and I think there, there, there is a growing body of research in that work that talks about uh, the importance of that level of empowerment and command in their own education. And so that is something in, it, in addition that uh, we're going to work at. You know, that's not necessarily going to fall on a, on a teacher's plate, but, but, it, but uh, some teachers do it already, you know. Uh, uh, but, it, but I think it, it may be something that uh, I'm trying to get creative on how I address it because I'm not interested in putting another thing on a teacher's plate. Right. As you so aptly demonstrated the challenges around IEPs and and writing those documents and those kinds of things. But a system wide resource in way that we can we can utilize uh, all manpower uh, to support this kind of an initiative. So more on those two uh, later. But Mr. Smith. <laughs> um, I've heard I've heard all the, a lot of comments from my colleagues, but once again, as a as a person who grew up in this district can understand the importance of this. Um, you know, I, all, everyone bring great ideas, but I'm, it's, it's frustrating hearing this and also knowing that we've had, we've had, that we also do have funding to mitigate some of these things, you know, to, to me, it's, it's almost like, you know, we've been talking about this since the cow, since the cow's been coming home. Now is we have the option that also we have the funds I'm looking to see it actually get done. I mean, yeah, you know, we can talk around all day about how we're going to get it done, but I'm looking for results because the crime rate in Beaufort County is going up. Our, our kids are, are, are hurting. And I understand that we have uh, groups that are doing things and we are, we, we, we're moving, but that's not helping the bottom. That's not helping the bottom line. And it's not helping these numbers grow. And it's not educating. It's, it's not educating the kids to where we need them to be because at the end of the day when they walk across that stage as a senior we need them to be able to go get a job at golf screen we need them to go able to be able to go get jobs in places where they haven't they, they, they have not fathomed where they can they can compete with other people so in in, in terms of i hear i i hear what's been said i appreciate it the community that i represent we're looking for results because we've been in this predicament in this situation for some quite some time now before the pandemic. And 
we just we want more. We we look we're looking for more, and this is a tough conversation. It's uncomfortable, but at at in the at in the end of the day, you have a whole cluster on this list. So that can that that can that can that concerns me. You know, uh, being a, being one representative of, of that of that of that uh, cluster, and my community coming to me saying, "What are we going to do about educating our kids?" Yeah, we have this program, but we want more. So I'm going. I'm going to just iterate that, and then also along with that, you know, I, I look around the room. You know, I, I've been saying this since the last time. You know, from we talk, we, we, we ever, a lot of people around this table talked about zero to five and and the the, the um, kindergarten and all that. Okay. Also, what have we done to bring our to to incorporate ourselves with other with other agencies around here? Not just besides the agencies that we've done after school, like as in Head Start. What, what you know? Because bringing those kids into our programs or helping them or working with them, if you're not seen having that conversation, what are y'all doing? How can we help you guys? How can you? What's your program doing? How can it foster into ours? Have we had that conversation? Because at Head Start, from my understanding. The, the, the parents have to is required to come to the meeting. So that's training right there that we can partner up on and, and give those parents that training. Because if your child if your child goes to Head Start, then your child's required. So I, that I've been talking about that until I'm green in the face. And we saying, well, we're gonna do this. So that goes of, of why I'm saying what I'm saying is because that is something that I've told that I've told the last time we went over some of this stuff. I spoke about that. I have not seen nothing done to in, 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 in terms of that. In fact, I see we had the one we have the uh head start director in the room tonight. I mean, these conversations have to have is, is good, but we need action to be taking place because it is affecting our community and the numbers. Uh, we are looking for the numbers in, in this and in the information to go up, not not keep coming down. I mean, it, it seems it seems rough and it seems, but this is a this is this is what we I were elected for. This this is very important. I'm looking to see where those those relationships are happening, and we are hearing from other organizations that say we're talking and we're working. Thank you. How about Mr. Mel? Excuse me, Mr. Earl Campbell. Um. I sit here and I listen to the comments. The district has put in a lot of things in, 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 in place, but parents need to be involved also. You can't blame all on the district if parents doesn't be involved in their kid education. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we have several churches that work with students after school programs. We got about what? Over 200 black churches in our community, over 200. What are they doing? You know, when I came up, that's where I got a lot of education from. And parents has to be involved. You know, I don't care how many programs is in place, the school district put in place, but if parents are not involved, you're going to get to keep getting the same results. And we can't blame COVID because there were things put in place when COVID was here. You know, but a lot of it, the parents did not stand up to the plate. And, you know, we can blame the district, we can blame everybody else. We need to blame our community and ourselves as parents. Thank you. All right. Why don't we have Dr. Rodriguez? You want to comment? Let's make this wrap it wrap it up. I, mean, I think I'll just I, mean. I think I'll just wrap it up with uh, with this thought as uh, as we close out this session. There are lots of schools. There are schools on this list who made growth, who made significant growth, but still on the list. You have one particular school that's school an excellent, excellent rated school, an excellent rated school because of the significant growth that they made because of the growth, not only in student individual student growth, but also in growth of student achievement. But then it comes down to the same comment that I think Mr. Nay was trying to get at, uh, which, which dealt with one particular subgroup may get you on a list, right? And and I think that's that's a reality. So you you have a school that is showing 
tremendous growth, tremendous movement in achievement, excellent rating on the list. Let's not lose that perspective as we close out this session. Madam Chair, I do have to add one thing. I would be remiss. Two of our schools also that I didn't mention are not on the list, and that is Joseph Shanklin as well as Pritchettville Elementary. I do have to put that out as well to recognize the hard work of those educators, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the, sorry, I stopped for a minute. On the superintendent's report, it's fiscal responsibility and a, a budget process update for you. Oh, good evening, once again. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, this budget update was not on our scheduled list of, of updates for the board. We weren't anticipating to begin this early, but there were a couple of board members who mentioned wanting to begin early. Uh, and we did have enough information that I felt was um, was um, worthy of bringing forward to you this after uh, this evening. So um, I'm going to make it relatively brief, but I'm hit some major points of information that help us begin our process. So there are two major categories anytime we're working on the budget. And by the way, we have about a $300 million budget, which is one of probably the largest budget in the uh, of any governmental entity in the entire Beaufort County. So it is does take an army of folks to put together, and we are in the process of doing that um, for from the expenditure side, what the needs are, gathering input from the community, and uh, gathering input from students and plans to do um, a lot of input and feedback uh, from that respect as well. Um, so, but you need to be careful or, or aware of the revenue sources that are available to you in order to balance that budget at the end of the day. There are some board policies that guide um, guide the work of our department. Uh, and it, I haven't listed out those board policies today, but in a future uh, report, I will do so. So I'm gonna start today with general fund revenue sources. So of the $300 million budget, um, you'll see in the dark blue uh, pie chart, just to get a perspective, 60% of our revenue sources come from local tax revenue. And so we are very dependent upon information that comes in in December and January. And fortunately, we got some information very late on Friday that I'm, allowed, I'm able to bring forward to you good, good information today regarding that. So that, that's 60% of the battle right there. Uh, unfortunately, the state, as you know, is in the legislative process and is just beginning to deliberate the budget. And so that uh, the, the updates that come from as a result of the bills and uh, the proposals of the governor and the state superintendent do take a quite lengthy time for discussion and are, are much later in the budget process. Therefore, uh, it puts us late in March or early April until we receive information from st the state on at least a third of our budget. So it is considerable, uh, but there is that's sometimes uh, puts us behind where we would like to be. Um, but again, most of the state funding is in the Education Finance Act and the tier three property tax relief, which is what substituted uh, when Act 3D8 was enacted back in, oh gosh, can't remember what year, um, but that removed the operations taxes from residential homeowners and replaced it with a one cent sales tax at the state level. That's about a $50 million pot of money. Uh, and we wait each year to make sure we are, receive and have that proper amount uh, to provide support for this budget. So the next slide is current tax revenues. This one's probably most important slide of all that I'm providing to you this evening. I always like to look at it from a linear perspective. We see multiple years here, and the most important number is in the top right-hand quadrant under 22-23. Uh, as of January 31st, we've received $171.9 million in local tax revenue which is 96.5% of our budgeted revenues. So we are in, as you see, if you look across, uh, there were prior years, it's hard to compare some years because there were different situations that um, allowed for uh, extending, the county extending tax deadlines. 
or um, the deadline for payment or else or either they uh, extended or waived any penalties for non-payment for those folks who were appealing their tax bills, which occurred, uh, I believe that was last year. The prior year, the deadline was extended to March 31st. So we have some, I think that was a COVID due to COVID. So as you can see, it's relatively inconsistent, but 96.5% compared to the other four prior years are much higher uh, than we have seen in the last four years. So we are in a very good position. Um, we will, uh, we do expect that we will likely exceed our revenue budget for the year due to this information. Um, there's about $10 million remaining typically for the, to collect through the rest of the year. So very minimal. You can see we've collected almost all of it. And so we will be watching this information very closely in order to develop the value of the mill for next year. So we project out this year and, and a report um, based on uh, do our values of the mill and project our tax revenues for the next year based on current information. So in the next slide, we talk about um, there's mill rate cap. Another critical point for us, um, our mill rate, although it's local tax revenue, are, is capped by the state under Act 388. So it does cap the amount we can raise millage from year to year, and it is on a percentage basis. So there are two major elements that are uh, built, are made up of that cap, and it is one, the consumer price index. Uh, it's given to us from the South Carolina, South Carolina Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office, and two is the growth based on U.S. Census data. So one, it com one comes in early and has come in already. The census data has not arrived and usually is available in April. I think we received it the first week of May last year. So again, that's some late data, uh, late information that we have. But I believe what we have here is enough information that will uh, to work with our budget to go forward. Because the CPI is listed, we were indicated that we were going to be uh, an eight percent CPI this year, uh, consumer price index, which is higher than I have ever seen working on the budget in twenty years. Um, last year it was four point seven percent. And the prior years, it was 1.8%, I believe. So as you can see, 8% of our current millage of 125.6 mills allows us to bring under the current uh, year's growth or current year's estimate, at least 10 mills is the possible increase. And again, we don't have CPI uh, growth yet. And then last year, we did bank 4.7 mills. Uh, we used four mills and we banked 4.7. So as you can see, we have at least four, almost five, 15 mills already to work with. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we are recommending in any way that we use all of those, but it does allow us some flexibility to use some and perhaps bank some for future years as well. So this is really critical to the development of the budget and it allows us some flexibility to make some decisions uh, based on our needs. On the next slide, I'm moving more toward expenditures at this point. Um, so the first thing we take a look at during the budget time is what is the governor saying and what is the state superintendent saying? And this year, unlike last year, they are saying virtually the same thing. <laughs> As you recall, last year we began with a $4,000 teacher salary increase from the governor, but $2,000 from the state superintendent. And there were some other differences, but we ended up, I believe, with one or the other. The district took the path of the $4,000 increase and stuck with that throughout the remainder of the year. And that put us at number one in the state in the terms of the teacher's uh, highest teacher starting teacher salary schedule in South Carolina. Um, this year, we our goal is to stay there. So with this budget, you'll have two priorities, basically the $2,500 teacher salary increase on every cell, every uh, every step, every grade of the teacher salary schedule. And then um, the there is a, the governor and the state superintendent are also recommending a $2,500 teacher retention supplement that would be non-recurring. Um, and then there are some bus driver retention supplements, 
and uh, teacher supply is, uh, increases as well from $300 to $350. Those are through EIA funds, that final one. So it's really important to, to let help you to um, be aware of this uh, calendar. This is our more of our working calendar. Um, we have a, a board calendar, but these this is a summary. We have a much more detailed one uh, back in the office. But what we've done so far is we've calculated our uh, enrollment projections. We've applied those to formulas for every school for their non-salary allocations. So these are supply allocations that go to every school. And we do an enrollment projection. We multiply it by a per pupil amount. And that amount is sent to the principal and they uh, build their budget. We give them prior year information, historical information, and they send it back with their allocations um, by their individual account numbers. We've also done that with our um, de district departments and those were all due back on Friday, last, last Friday. And so uh, we're making good headway on getting that information back in. And then uh, we'll be vetting that as we move forward. Uh, this week as well, we will be taking the salaries and projecting those, uh, the current salaries, uh, rolling these uh, proposed increases from the state in, as well as benefit increases that we're expecting. Health insurance is always, and retirement are always two that increase. And we'll be rolling those into the budget as well. So we combine those, vet it, see if we missed anything, go back and uh we continue to look for uh, feedback. There may be additions for particular programs. And um, thank you. Uh, and then we'll continue to move forward. Uh, and our next budget workshop uh, is scheduled to be on March 24th. That's a, a board work session. So it will allow us some more time to go into a little bit more depth of the budget. Although the time that we have um, we will continue to work on the information, get some final projections in probably early April, and we'll come back with a total budget toward the end of April. Um, so again, we're, we're kind of hands are tied by some of the state revenue information that we receive, and uh, we'll, but we'll continue to work on things throughout from now until then. Um, one one major point we did start we did at the recommendation of our director of uh, budget and procurement this year we started with seeking community input on the beginning of the process instead of toward the end once it was built and we can do it again um, but we did have a lot of success uh, with the help of the communications department Miss Bruder just brought me an update uh, we put. Uh, a, a comment, uh, sort of what it, some of our challenges are this year as we move into the budget year and a couple of questions out on Bang the Table, which is a engagement, uh, community engagement section of our website. Uh, we have total visits to the website of 3,500 people. Participants who visited at least one page, 2,778. Participants, par participants who visited multiple pages, 1,300. And those who engaged or in contributed ideas, 425. I think we almost, I think we more than doubled our participation already from last year, and we're just getting started. So very good comments. We've uh, made copies for all of senior staff and Dr. Rodriguez. And so we all know what the community is saying. Um, it was open. It was sent out to parents, uh, employees. Uh, it, and so it was a wide array, and we're not done yet. So. Very excited about that. Um, again, uh, continued. We're going to continue to uh, monitor our local revenues, project current and future revenues, both local and state, and monitoring these legislative updates that are coming around. We're seeing a lot of those. We're providing fiscal impacts back to the legislature regularly. I think there were five of them in the last two days. Um, and then we continue to just compile the budget as a whole and vet it. Uh, and monitor uh, major increases and decreases, and then put presentations together for the board. So, uh, and then we begin, um, once we bring back the whole budget, we'll look over a series of meetings for a certification, and then we go to county council for three more readings of the budget. So, uh, which end typically at the very end of June. So in, in, in that uh, process and timeline, 
not listed there, but um, one of the things that we started last year is something that generally school districts across the country do not do, but we did it last year and we're going to do it again this year. And that is to have uh, a, a session in here with uh, students from across the district. The students have a voice in the budget as well uh, as part of uh, input uh, from, from our students. So we will follow up and we will do that again uh, this year uh, during this during this process. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions or comments? Dr. Wisniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just going to take a, a moment to ask if the board members have uh, a chance to, to Google Act 388 impacts on Beaufort County School District. The very first thing that comes up is a lovely report that was done and compiled back in May of 2013, mm -hmm. I believe. So it's coming up on it being a decade old. Um, it makes some conclusions and predictions in there, one of which I'm just going to read briefly because I think it's really important. Um, it says if Beaufort County continues to grow and if a large share of that growth is in owner-occupied residential property, that generates no additional taxes for school operations and no increase in state property tax relief, which then must be funded by the school district, the school district's present healthy fiscal position is likely to deteriorate. At that point, the pressure will turn to the mill rate. And so I think it's really important that the board members familiarize themselves with this study that was done. It was funded, I believe, by the South Carolina Realtors Association, <laughs> Um, I'd love for us to see if they'd be willing to do a, a refresh of that to see what findings they may, might glean, if their conclusions were accurate because they made multiple. Um, but I just wanted to take the moment, since we're having a conversation, Act 388 has been referenced here, to get on that soapbox. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Smith? Uh, Mrs. Crosby, uh, my mom told me that... Uh, the same way you uh you know, but you ought to praise people publicly. And I just wanted to tell you, I know I've been the one who's been asking you because sometimes it is difficulty in terms of doing the budget and you get overwhelmed with people coming to you, different things and understanding it. And I really appreciate you bringing us this forward so that I can start to digest this mm -hmm. moving into the budget season because I've definitely been one who's been advocating for that. And I really appreciate you. I see, I, I see your work, I see you. Uh, I see you, you you made a conscious effort to put it in front of us and to get us information. I just want to tell you, I do appreciate you wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more questions, as we conclude uh, the superintendent's report, Tanya, do you want to make mention of the other uh, accolade that uh, you got <laughs> the other day? Yes. Um, so in addition to the ESSER um, uh, recognition that we received from the state, we received from Tyler Technologies. We've been nominated and um, and are getting an award, have been awarded uh, the Tyler Excellence Award. Uh, Tyler Technologies is the parent company of MUNIS, uh, which is our municipal information system. It's an ERP uh, enterprise reporting system that we do financials. Uh, and it and it's connected through almost every business operation in our district, uh, from human resources, technology, uh, all all throughout. So um, we have been selected for this award uh, based on our integration to uh, moving from a self-hosted model to the cloud. Uh, seamless. Um, over 900 uh, districts were moving to the cloud at the same time, and we were awarded for being one of the most efficient at the process. And I have to thank, I have a great team, and it was led by the project management skills of Sheila Burtz uh, in, our, in our office as our business systems person. So uh, I want to commend the team for that as well. And we'll be accepting the award in San Antonio around uh, May 10th or so. Uh, on a national stage, probably in front of thousands of people. So we're excited about it. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. It's 9 p.m. So we need to go on to public comments. Our first uh, commenter, I believe the last name is Cooper, though I'm having great difficulty reading the uh, printing. Sorry. Peter Cooper. Yeah, bad handwriting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
and uh, your topic is book debate. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? This this meeting, uh, you know, without anyone, you know, yelling at anyone, calling anyone a groomer, a pedophile. I, I just, you know, I think it's nice when we can get things done. We don't have to deal with all this fear, but fear is is good. It's good. It means that people care and parents care. It's just sometimes that's directed in the wrong way. And I, I got to say, I, I appreciate y'all doing your jobs of, of seeing these things we should truly be fearful for and directing them in the right way. The conversation had about the drug testing. I don't I won't tell you what to do there. I have no idea. But I value that. I, I value that you had the time to address that rather than addressing um, fears that as a student, I know don't really make sense. I've had three different friends on four separate occasions overdose. That That's a legitimate problem that we should be addressing rather than some fear that that of, of an essentially non-existent issue. Um, it just, I, w- I want to appreciate that we have the time and the ability to do that unhindered now. Um, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you for your comment. Next up, we have James Williams speaking about Lobico School. Good evening, Madam Chair, Superintendent. Um, actually, today is my birthday, and uh, I didn't go to dinner or go have a party. I said I'm gonna come to a school board meeting. I don't know what that says about me socially, but that's what I'm. That's what I did. Um, the Labico School's last active usage was as a Head Start classrooms. Um, this body, I think, almost 39 years ago, indefinitely uh, agreed to give that property uh, to, to the Head Start program to serve the most disadvantaged families in that community. Now, the building has went through some uh, uh, hard times lately, uh, and we've currently been waiting on uh, federal money to try to repair it. My understanding now is that the county has some uh, uh, desires to utilize that property, um, and ultimately what we want is what's best for the community. You know, and I know there's been several conversations about uh, how to best serve the community, but through a lot of siloed conversations. You know, I think for for the sake of the community, we need to have a collective conversation between the decision makers so that we can best put a, a product ahead that can best serve that community moving forward. So I, I hope that that is the direction of this board uh, moving forward so that we can get something out there that can uh, best you be utilized in that community. I, I heard uh, uh, Member Dallas talk about birth to five. When I heard you talking, you were describing Head Start. You know, according to the National Association for the Education of Young Children, there's a 30 million word gap between the children in your most affluent families and your children in your most disadvantaged families. 30 million words. So, you know, Head Start is a is the most successful and most uh, the best platform for early education, and you know. We talked about parent engagement. Parent engagement is a learned behavior. You know, and that's one thing that we do. We require, the program requires the parents be involved from day one. And the district does not have to wait. We can expand that program. It just requires funding. So anytime the district wants to have a conversation about how to expand that that successful platform, uh, we'll, we'd love to have that conversation. But it, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not cheap. It's the cost per child is about the same as the district cost per child. But the success of our community, our future, is in that birth to five uh, community. So if we don't best serve them now, then what will we be leaving uh, for, for the future? So something to think about. Um, other than that, hope everybody have a great evening. Uh, we can conclude by saying a happy birthday if you like. But if not, thank you very much. Thank you and happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. 
And next up, we have Isabella Troy uh, speaking uh, on student voices. Um, hello again. Um, so I have nothing incredibly special tonight, but I am deeply grateful for the board continuing to listen to student voices. And I even urge you to allow schools to have organizations that teach us how to have a voice. Um, but real quick, um, I'd like to circle back around to a comment directed towards a statement I made last board meeting. So I had stated that 12 kids a day were killed as a result of gun violence, um, not as the result of um, reading books with tough, tough topics to which an individual who's not to be named responds with the, the Crusades, um, which were fought over the right to Holy Land and uh, were the result of Pope Urban II giving a false sermon, which just further proves my point that we should be reading rather than receiving our um, information through second sources as they aren't um, always trustworthy. And I don't think that they were throwing books at each other, um, but I digress. I thank the board for hearing us at each meeting that we attend, and I hope that you guys will continue doing so. And I urge you to continue valuing student voices and opinions and use them in decision making when they can be applied. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, one comment by phone. about school safety and um in the meantime i think it was in october mrs Fidrick, um who was a former board member made a motion to direct the superintendent to um conduct a feasibility study on implementing hall monitors back into the school uh, middle school and high school and I'm just hoping that that didn't get lost in the mix. And I'm hoping that a board member um, will bring that up and ask when that will be presented. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Next up is board business action. And uh, we have OE8 uh, facilities. Ms. Boatwright, you pulled it to board business. Yeah, sorry, I had a little hard time getting off my mute there. Okay, um, yeah, I pulled it off because I listened to the um, operations committee meeting, and I don't. I still, I just want to put on the record. I don't think we're doing coherent governance exactly right. We used to break it down into eleven point two, eleven whatever, and then now we're doing it all at one time. Um, but fundamentally, what I see the OEs are, these are the things that we're supposed to be asking about and caring about how it relates to what our expectations are for the school, et cetera. And so, in my opinion, as I've said on numerous times, we should be tying our actions to the policy. Um, in this case, what I wanted to bring up was OE um, 8.11. Uh, and basically, OE, sorry, give me one sec here. OE 8.11 says, Review grade configurations annually, school attendance boundaries and potential future impact areas to ensure reasonable balances of school enrollment, wise use of resources and equity of high quality learning opportunities and submit any recommended changes to the board for approval in accordance with the district's agreement with the US Department of Education. The interpretation is, is that we will track school capacity utilization. Uh, staff shall provide the board phased capacity notification for schools that are not at the target 85% capacity. Presenting options involve public comments. Uh, staff shall get direction from the board in review of options. Return to step two if options are not accepted by the board. And what was said um, was uh, basically that um, the naming of the, let's see, where is it? 
Uh, any questions about any right? Item 11 has to do with attendance boundaries. Uh, again, that's dealt with the, the facilities master plan, and that concludes my review. And I'm like, if this is how we are actually going to govern, you know, or how we're going to tie this together, I, and it ties to my earlier comment, I want opinions and analysis. I don't just want the enrollment data. I want someone to add something to it and say, here's a recommendation. Even if the, even if the recommendation is, hey, look, we've looked at this. We've got a referendum coming. We don't want to make any changes right now. Let's have a conversation. But I don't think that just presenting the facilities assessment plan and saying we've checked off that, you know, fairly critical um, OE 8.11, and then kind of moving on is what really was envisioned by coherent governance. So I don't want to, at this point, try to bring up OE 8.11, et cetera. It's more of a general sense that I don't think that's what really um, was really adequate in terms of uh, a monitoring for that, because I think these are big topics in the two plus years I've been on the board. We haven't had a ton of discussions about the enrollment. We've got this referendum coming up. We've got Pritchardville and I I'm confused on program versus um, capacity, but I think programmatically Pritchardville is at 160% and we have schools in like the fifties and even I think the forties. So to me, there's the general sense of if you're going to have a monitoring report, it needs to reflect the OE. And also, we do need to start having these conversations coming into this referendum about enrollment, about targets, about capacity. Those are my comments. Thank you. Dr. Wisniewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll echo what um, Ms. Boatwright stated. Um, I did notice something else on this uh, report on page four. Um, item F, it says that the operational department will make the board aware of all major construction project RFPs prior to the public advertisement of the RFP. And I think in its indicator, it, it stated only one RFP. And I'm pretty sure that there's been many more besides just the one for Hilton Head that were referenced. So I don't think that's being followed to the letter. Um, so I'll be abstaining from this one. Thank you. Gary, would you like to make a motion? I'm to make a motion right now because I think there needs to be more more work done. Okay. Um, I think we need <clears throat> we need some more um, policy input from the policy committee, and so. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not ready to make a motion. Okay. All right. So since I was just suggesting, I was just asking you since it was under the um, your committee. So we don't need to take any action. So. It'll have to come back, I guess, um, since we're approving the other one under consent agenda and this was pulled off. It'll have to come back after. I don't know if you want policy committee to review this report and kind of pick it apart. What's question. the will of the board? I'm a question. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Are we looking for it come back for additional work and back to the operations committee? I think it would come back. Turn on you. Yep. Come back to the operations committee just to be vetted before giving it to the full board for approval. Okay. Mr. Smith. Well, actually, that was it was already handled after that. That's, that was my my, my logic of thinking that it would come back to the board, and it, and, and that also at that time, if we needed to, then we could we could uh, make that motion, or we could if there's with the will of the board, we could send it to the policy if, if necessary. Thank you. All right. So, if there's any objections for it going to the policy committee at this point, and then operations, uh, please raise your objection now. If there are no objections, that will be the process. All right. Policy and then operations. Next up, we have the consent agenda, and there are two items on there, the February 7, 2023 board meeting minutes and operational expectations 16, the FOIA annual report that we already heard. 
I would like to just say one thing. I noticed uh, one problem with the minutes after we approved the agenda, and that is at the very top, we have members present and absent, but we don't have all 11 members that are seated. And I do think all 11 members should be on there. Yeah. yeah. So, Madam Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda with the name changes. All right, and Mr. So Dr. Wisniewski made the motion, um, and uh, Mr. Carlton Dallas second the motion. So it would be approving these two documents, but uh, modifying, as I already mentioned, and listing all seated board members on whether they're present or absent on the minutes, and that's a requirement by FOIA, actually. So it has to be on there. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any. Uh, Nays? Any abstentions? Um, so, hey, and uh, Boatwright, yes? Boatwright, yeah. yes. Yeah, thank you, ladies. All right, so the consent agenda uh, passes uh, unanimously. Um, next up is future agenda topics. Mr. Smith? Um, since we've had the guidance counselors um uh, we said the guidance counselors day. Uh, since I, I know it's, it's been a while since we've uh, had the guidance counselors bring us an update on what they're doing and where they are at. Graduation is, is circling around. And I don't think I would like for we would like for an update uh, about what the what the head of guidance is doing and, and, and what that looks like. OK, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wisniewski. Um, as I previously mentioned, the uh, study that was done, the Act 388 study to see if the board is. Um, in favor of asking for that to be redone. All right, Mr. Um, ne <laughs> Victor Ney. Yes, um, as we previously discussed, I'd like to uh, look at reducing the scope of the book reviews from uh, 10 down to five. I know there are some members that uh, are, are, not, uh, are not able to read the books, but I would like to be able to read books and 10 is too much in two weeks. All right. Mr. Earl Campbell? Yes. Um, I I think I, I think one of the callers talked about about um, challenging the book, but they don't. If you're going to challenge something, let me know what you're challenging. We don't know what they're challenging. They don't don't they explain to us. All they say they're challenging, and they blame the district. So I think that's something that needs to be cleared up. So book challenge uh, process or is what they're challenging. Okay. Be online. All right. So that seems to be uh, future agenda topics. Any announcements, Dr. Rodriguez? No. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we already did the second public comment. So before we adjourn the, the, um, board has to go back into, <laughs> thank you, Secretary Middleton, the board has to go back into executive session, um, and then we will come back out into public session to finish off the meeting. So the board members, let's take a five-minute break for the bathroom or a sip of water or whatever, and we'll meet back in conference room E.